Hi, this is Tom Rhodes. Please join me as I scour the four corners of the earth to bring you interesting and intelligent, funny people who will enrich your life with wisdom and laughter. I'll take you to Europe, Australia, all over America. I might take you to the peaks of Machu Picchu, the canals of Amsterdam, the Great Wall of China, or the swamps of Florida, and certainly the many, many comedy clubs and comedy theaters all over the world. Come hang out with me and meet the many interesting people that pop up in my life as I travel the world as a stand-up comedian. You're listening to Tom Rhodes Radio. Karate kick, baby. Rock and roll. Cliff Nesterhoff, ladies and gentlemen. Cliff Nesterhoff, what a thrill and delight to have you in my home. My pleasure. You've got a beautiful home. I'm sure you've described it for your listeners several times. (laughs) Never. They have no idea what it looks like. But it's just full of books that uh, probably neither of us have ever read. And a nice looking record collection over there. It's got a very nice homey feel. It's... uh, I like the idea of books and music being surrounded by books and music. Yeah. Well, it sounds like we have different philosophies because you said you have when you read books, you give them away. Yeah, if I finish a book that I really like, it often brings to mind people that I know who would also really like it. So I like to distribute the, the knowledge if possible. Also, I used to be a record collector and I know what a burden it is, like an anchor around your neck. Is that a phrase? Albatross? Albatross, Um, yeah. Because you can't move. And if you do, it's such an ordeal. And I moved from Canada, so I wasn't going to bring hundreds of boxes across the border. So I liquidated my record collection, which was something I thought I would never, ever do. But my God, what a liberating feeling it was. I tried to sell my record collection, discovered that the concept of value and worth is a fallacy. I had all these valuable records, which I tried to sell, and nobody wanted they're to buy They're not valuable when they're buying, but only when they're selling them. Yeah, only when they're sold. But So value is only what you can sell something for. So I had so-called valuable jazz records from the 50s, you know, translucent red vinyl, like the Lenny Bruce fantasy records, all the jazz wow. records uh, on red translucent vinyl, supposedly worth a lot of money, but I would put them on eBay, and they would sell for like a dollar a piece or a lot, would go for $10. Wow. I go, okay, I guess that means they're worth... Ten dollars, because if they were worth hundreds of dollars, they would have. Sold. You should have brought those to Los Angeles, because I had an old Bob Dylan bootleg from Toronto, and the, the show is the sound quality is terrible. It's it was unlistenable, but I was stoned. I was in some record store in the nineties, and I saw it. I bought it for thirty bucks. I took it to Cosmic Vinyl on um, Melrose. And they gave me like 90 bucks in-store credit. So especially those colored yeah. vinyl things are, are, are really, even if the, the record itself is a piece well, of shit. Well, it, it turned into a philosophical thing for me. Because the first half of my record collection I sold or tried to sell. And then I started to vend some of them at record conventions in Vancouver. And that was fun because I got to meet people that were enthusiastic about it. And because I wanted to get rid of them, I did not sell for like exorbitant prices i would sell things at a box that was a dollar all good stuff a box that was five dollars and a box that was ten dollars and the ten dollar box was stuff that normally you'd see a record dealer sell for a hundred dollars and so it was fun people were really excited to get these cheap records but then i discovered that there were vendors from other tables coming over and buying my records and then selling them at their tables for three times the price and that just kind of made me uh, You're like who's this who's this rube from the countryside yeah. selling all this valuable stuff for so such a low price? the last half of my record collection, I gave away. Uh, you know, I had friends who were like me, really into old country and Western. I gave them all my country and Western. My comedy records, comedy records are the least valuable of all yeah. vinyl. Um, I gave to a fellow stand-up a thousand comedy records because I knew he appreciated that kind of stuff. So that was actually really gratifying for me. I was like, these are going into a home where the people appreciate it. It's not going to some... Uh, predatory record vendor who's going to jack up the price and it's going to sit there uh, dusty, you know. Uh, and I was never a stickler for condition. I'd like to listen to records that have like the a, pops. I and like that. I love it too. Yeah, same yeah. with film. That's why I like going to the New Beverly. I like seeing a little hair on the side <laughs> of the film, like twinkling there, you know. Um, there's something about that that I, that I like. So 
Uh, for me, I, I like the idea that I eventually was giving away my record collection and today I give away books as long as it goes to somebody I know who's into it. That's all that matters. Okay. Well, keep me in mind when you finish oh, some classics. Oh, absolutely. Classic. I will. No, and the reason I have so many books is because uh, I learned at a very young age when you lend books, you never get them back. So mm. uh, sometime in my early 20s, I stopped lending books and I thought it would be great to amass uh, the greatest book collection of what I'm interested in anyway. It kind of adds an incredible atmosphere to any home. It almost makes you feel like you're in like an old movie, you know, where the guy has the hound dog and he's smoking a pipe. And That's what I was going for. Yeah. 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 It's a nice, warm kind of vibe and feeling. And I like that as well. And so my house is full of books that I haven't read that eventually I will read. But I like that idea of being surrounded by uh, uh, information, I guess. Great. Well, let's talk about your book because I have two copies of uh, Cliff Nesterhoff's The Comedians. And uh, you may be wondering why I have a hardback and a paperback version of your classic that I think anybody interested in comedy um, or wanting to do comedy should read. Uh, a very great old friend of mine, Jay Her Herzog, who lives in Arcata, California and works in a bookstore, I was up there and he told me, I just got a pre-copy of this book. And you're going to love it. And he was about halfway through it. So he told me when the book was coming out. And so I, I bought it when it came out because there's nothing uh, I'm interested in more than comedy right. and the history of comedy. So I got the book immediately. As you can tell by the highlights, I loved it and really. I love that. Yeah. Uh, I highlight all the books that I, I read and I love. Looks like you may have bled on it. Uh, that may have been today. Uh, I cut myself shaving. And <laughs> that, uh, those blood marks are from today. So um, my darling little niece, Christina, at Christmas, she was so excited. She said, you are the hardest person in the family to buy presents for. But I think I really nailed it this year. And so I opened up the present and it was the paperback of it. And I couldn't hide yeah. the look on my face and I told her I, I already read it I'm sorry so <laughs> that's why I have two copies but th but she was right she was absolutely right. she couldn't have gotten a better Christmas so you provided probably one of the best Christmas <clears throat> gifts well this is good it means you have a copy of the pre Alan Bursky a lawsuit and post Alan Bursky lawsuit huh. copies of the book Alan Bursky so what so he sued you and something had to be taken out yeah <laughs> no way yeah. But it, was it the fact that he gave Freddie Prinze the gun that he killed himself with? That's uh, Everyone knows that. Yeah, well, he says that's not true. And <clears throat> I based it on another book that said that. So uh, he felt that he was... I guess, I'm, I'm, I'm conjecturing a bit, but I think he felt that I was implicating him somehow, which I guess was a bone of contention for He didn't throw the trigger? No, no, sir. Uh, but I also based it on uh, an interview with Robert Klein, and uh, I think that other book, Comedy at the Edge, talks about it. So, I, when I met him, when I was a real young comedian, I swear I remember asking him, because that's what he was famous, and what a terrible thing to be known for, mm -hmm. that you gave a comedian yeah. a gun that he killed himself with. And I'm pretty sure he said that, you know, it was true. So I don't... Mm, well, I don't he, said, he said it wasn't true. And I'm I'm not going to debate the man. He, yeah. he was either, you know, he's much closer to the source yeah. than I am. Well, so, I, I mean, I was I, like, it's I, not In, in comedy, often mythology come, becomes fact. And, totally, totally, yeah. totally. So, you know, I had no problem uh, uh, changing that for him. My publisher was like, do you want to stand by this? I'm like, well, I have sources, but no, I don't want to fight a guy. Like, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't affect the trajectory of the book or the narrative or anything. If he feels slighted or wronged by it, just change it. I got no problem Great. with Great. Well, now I have reason to keep both of these yes, books. There you go. Great. There awesome. You go. Um, my only... I, I think the, 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 the book is, is brilliantly written. I learned oh, so you. much about comedy history that I didn't know before that I want to talk to you about. But uh, my only issue with mm -hmm. the book... Don't sue me, please. Don't no, sue no, 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 not at all. No, I'm I'm here to praise you and honor you, my brother. Um, it didn't start with, in my opinion, Mark Twain invented stand-up comedy. Right, right. Well, I I wanted to figure out <clears throat> where to start because initially, when I pitched this book to the publisher, it was just going to be about comedians and the mafia, 
because I'd not read about that before, the story of comedians having to work for the mob who ran all the nightclubs at the time. So I wanted that to be the book. And they said, well, we'll give you more money and more time if you write a longer book that goes back further and comes up more current. And I didn't know that I could make either of those things interesting. I, I was not like a vaudeville nerd, you know, I didn't know that much about it. And before I wrote the book, I thought of it as something kind of inaccessible to a modern comedy fan or even just a modern mentality. And same thing with the newer stuff. They wanted me to write about Twitter and YouTube. And I was like, well, nobody cares. Like, why would anybody want to read about Twitter, you know? But I did it. And so I arbitrarily decided just like 100 years of comedy. So you can go back as far back as you want. People will argue about Chaucer, I don't know how to say his name. Chaucer? Ch Chaucer? Chaucer? Chaucer. I Chaucer. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I read words, but I don't know how to say them. In fact, I got, Tales. I got, I got a, a negative review on Audible, and somebody said he pronounces half the words wrong. I was like, oh, God, why didn't somebody tell me? Because <laughs> I think I do pronounce a lot of words wrong, because I read them, but I don't. No yeah, but it. what does that have to do with, um, with right? I mean, it, it makes it, me sound uneducated when I talk, when I say <laughs> Ch Chaucer instead of Chaucer. I don't know. <laughs> um, but anyways, I didn't start with Mark Twain, uh, who started much earlier. Also, it was like... Was that a consideration? It was sort of a consideration, you know. Mark Twain was on the lecture circuit. Or as a Canadian, you had your own prejudice. I'm kidding. My, I was very arbitrary about where I started. Like, because vaudeville goes back further than where I started the book. The book basically starts around 1900. But vaudeville existed for a good 30 years prior to that. It's sort of like a post-Civil War phenomenon and minstrel shows so and how did it grow out of the civil war the, uh, the 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 fact that everyone's in despair and broke and they needed a chuckle well it was generally african americans who were uh hypothetically free who started to tour by leaving the plantation leaving the south going to the north and kind of pick, picking up the tradition of, of music and performance that was sort of in slave quarters and bringing it sort of to a mass audience and touring around. So it sort of sprang uh, from that. Why it became popular as a, a universal entertainment, that I don't really know. But people like Mark Twain, H. H. L. Mencken, there were a lot of people that were writing newspaper columns. And at that time, before radio or television, that's kind of what made you famous. I'm a big fan of H.L. Mencken and Mark Twain. Yeah, I love I love Mencken as well. And I love Twain as well. Nobody, the phrase stand-up comedy didn't exist yet. So you could argue that it was stand-up. They were going on stage. They were speaking. They were getting laughs, you know. But nobody actually called them comedians. They were known as, as columnists and uh, orators, you know. Um, so an argument could be made, surely, that they invented stand-up, but I'm sure there was even somebody before them who did a similar thing. I don't know. But in terms of sort of the modern sensibility, I kind of stuck to the 20th century to the best of my... No, I love, that's what I love so much about the book. And, the, you know, and you're even very specific about who were the first guys who just only went with jokes in their performance on, on the vaudeville stage. Tell me about um, Lou Kelly, the guy who was... Addicted to, to narcotics. Lou Kelly did a, what they called a dope fiend act. Now, I don't know that he... Which is amazing. And so this is, this is post-Civil War vaudeville. Yeah. That, uh, so, I mean, so the sensibilities in America, people were like, oh, yeah, let's go see the guy who's whacked out on smack. Well, I don't know that Lou Kelly himself was a drug addict. Maybe he was. But he did an act that was an impression of a drug addict. It would be like you or I going on stage and, and tweaking, doing like a tableau of a meth addict we saw. And I guess it was common knowledge, the um, actions of drug addicts in that point. I mean, morphine was very, uh, and heroin were very popular in the post-Civil War era. First as treatment and medicine for like injured soldiers. And then later on just for, uh, you know, people who were just addicted. Opium was very popular in vaudeville. So these were not um, obscure topics people knew about them but yeah, like there was one there's one highlight in in the book that i i when i was looking through uh last night get, uh, getting ready for this that um one of the hotels where vaudeville performers stayed at the the only rule was no opium smoking on the elevator yeah that's right <laughs> that's right right 
Well, a lot of actors were considered as um, noble as just a drug addict. You know, acting and performing, you were considered... Uh, like a low life. Yeah, like no life. no mm-hmm. actors, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Yeah. Kind of those signs on boarding houses. Yeah, so when you toured from city to city, a lot of the places that you stayed were like SRO rooming houses where drunks and, and, and drug addicts lived and hung out. So it was a very kind of common... Um, uh, crossover. But Lou Kelly did what he called a dope fiend act, but he was known as the king of the dope fiend acts because it was a whole genre of comedy. <laughs> the way that, that guy over there, he's a hack dope fiend. Yeah, act. yeah. You've seen a Jack Nicholson impression, but this guy does the best Jack Nicholson impression. You've seen the dope fiend act, this guy does the best dope fiend act. Lou Kelly, yeah. L E W, Lou Kelly, yeah. And uh, the. Let me read a couple of of, uh, of, of quotes here. The da, 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 the phrase "working blue" came into usage at the time. If a representative of the Keith Orpheum circuit objected to the content of an act, a request to cut the material was sent backstage in a blue envelope. Yeah. So like little factoids like that, and is what make this book so great, in my opinion. Well, I had to really research the vaudeville section because I didn't know that much about it, and I did struggle initially. I was like, how do you make it interesting for a modern audience? Because you can't really give too many examples of the comedy because people won't find it funny, you know. So what do you, what is relatable here? So I discovered reading a book by a guy named Joe Laurie Jr. He wrote a book called From. Uh, uh, Showbiz from Vod to Video, which was the first massive history of vaudeville. It came out in 1952. Joe Laurie Jr. himself was a comedian in vaudeville, so he wrote this this book. And because he had been part of that world, it's very well informed in terms of the lifestyle. And he interviewed a lot of his contemporaries who were still alive in 1952. And it's a big, fat book, like 900 pages. I myself was addicted to opiates when I read that book and I fucking loved it. It was so enjoyable (laughs) to read this 900 page book about uh, vaudeville. So I used that as the basis for a lot of this and I discovered that there was sort of like a, although it wasn't advertised as such in that book, it was a very scholarly book, there was like a sex, drugs, and rock and roll aspect to vaudeville in those days. These guys, and it was during the prohibition days, but they all had like a line on where to get their booze in each town, where to get their opium, Um, And the struggle of these guys doing the road, you know, bombing, figuring out their act. I saw the sort of analogy or the relation between that and modern stand-up. The lifestyle was the same. So the comedy was very different and maybe doesn't travel or translate to today to make anybody laugh. But the lifestyle was something that I was uh, sort of familiar with, like in the stand-up world. It was so similar. So that's kind of what I zeroed in on, you know, was the analogy of the similarities And then also the drug aspect and the sort of depravity aspect was something that I thought people would find very interesting. So I kind of zeroed in on that. And when I was researching all the vaudeville stuff and I read other books about vaudeville, most of them centered on the routines and the style of comedy. And you'll notice there aren't really any quotes from anybody's act in that section. And I think it's because it doesn't really travel well. And when an author says so-and-so was hilarious and then gives you an example on paper, it doesn't usually translate well like freud has a famous book called jokes in their relation to the unconscious i've got it and he gives you examples of hilarious jokes right and the book is like from 1902 yeah and so it's a very hard book to read because you're like what is he talking about hilarious joke whatever the example is and he was pissing himself because he was writing it yeah yeah (laughs) and then he explains to you why it's funny but you've just read it and decided it's not funny you know because it's 115 years old so uh i did not want to do that so I, for the sake of credibility. And if you read the book, you'll notice that I don't describe anybody as hilarious or funny or unfunny. And a lot of people think that <clears throat> based on who's included is like an editorial, somebody who I think is funny. But that's not true. I just kind of focused on who I felt was uh, interesting or influential. Well, another thing I loved about it that uh, you talk about Groucho Marx and the Marx Brothers, how their act developed... Um, on the vaudeville circuit and they're playing in the South and that they were, uh, you, you know, they're not only Jewish and a lot of these places, you know, the, um, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, they hated, you know, Jews and blacks and Catholics. And so yeah. not only being Jewish, they had New York accents, which also, um, you know, they were, uh, you know, yeah. reviled sight on 
on the spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, that was an interesting how the, the, that that had never occurred to me that you know they're they're um, you know defensive whip. Yeah, Harpo Marx. Harpo Marx. I quote in the book where he says they had three strikes against them. One, they were Jewish. One, they were from New York. And three, they were actors. So all of those things in uh, conservative towns in the South were. Um, again, I'm going to pronounce a word. I don't know how to pronounce. Do it. Anathema. How do you say it? Anathema. Oh, God damn it! I, lo- I love hanging out with you. I feel like a genius. <laughs> <laughs> You think that like reading all the time makes a man smart, but it really keeps you from knowing how to talk out loud. That's great. I always thought I had a limited vocabulary. No, no like I, I don't have like a high school <laughs> high school education, so I'm like uh, based on a self. And you've written educa- a book. And, yeah. And you don't have a uh, high school education? No. Well, I mean, I to the 11th grade. Oh, my God. And this, um, this Mo Howard story about how the Three Stooges came into being and... Larry Fine was, uh, he had a contract with this guy to play at the Rainbow Gardens. And then, what happened? This girl, what did, they had some... Well, two different people died, so... Yeah, well, this, this is such a great story. Uh, Mo Howard was something in, in a troupe called the Annette Kellerman uh, uh, Dancing Girls or Diving Girls. <clears throat> it was a swimming act on the vaudeville stage with a big uh, uh, diving board, and you would dive from the diving board into this tiny little pool... And somebody missed the pool and their head caved in and they died. And so they needed to replace the dead girl. And Mo Howard liked Larry Fine. He had seen his act. He was doing a different act with a violin. And Larry Fine said, well, I can't. I'm under contract to the Rainbow Gardens. And then just by coincidence, a week later, the uh, Rainbow Gardens burned to the ground and the guy who ran it uh, burned alive, the guy who he had the contract with. So now he was free to <laughs> to sign up with Mo Howard. So uh, two weird deaths uh, helped bring Larry Fine, the one with the frizzy hair, into the fold of what eventually grew into the Three Stooges. And they'd be nothing without Larry, let's be honest. I love Larry. I do too. I mean, he had the, he was the he had the vulnerability of because yeah. Curly was kind of the stupid fat guy, yeah, and Mo was the angry, mean, you know, punishment giver, yeah. and Larry was the guy that you identified with the most because he was vulnerable and looked like he was frightened. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that great look to them. Well, they all did, but uh, yeah, I, I love that. And Billy West when he did uh, Ren and Stimpy, Stimpy from Ren and Stimpy is an impression of uh, Larry Fine. When you, oh, I didn't know that. When, when you hear... I don't know if I... It's can been so it. many years since I saw Ren and Stimpy. Ren! It's, it's Larry Fine. It's the same uh, voice. He's the only person I've ever heard of who can do an impression of uh, Larry Fine. Everybody can do a Curly or a Mo, but nobody can Here's do a knowledge one. nugget for you. Um, in Argentina and the Spanish world, um, these three stooges are called the Chief Lados. Which are like, what is that translate? I'm I'm not sure exactly, but it, but it's the chief lotto. So look at that chief lotto over here. I think it's like the idiots or something like that. Chief lotto over here doesn't know how to pronounce <laughs> anathema. <laughs> he does now. Um, European fascism changed comedy in America. Benny, uh, Jack Benny, this is great information. Benny explained, during World War II, attitudes changed. Hitler's ideology of Aryan supremacy put all ethnic humor in a bad light. Mm. When the black man's fight for equal rights and fair play became an issue after the war, I would no longer allow Rochester to say or do anything that an audience would consider degrading. Benny's attitude towards race relations was enlightened. Starting in 1940, he refused to play any segregated venue. In the 1960s, when his agent scheduled a world tour, Benny chastised him for booking a gig in apartheid South Africa and refused to appear. I had no idea Jack Benny was so politically, socially conscious. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of comedians, tended to be progressive, although in later years, one of his best friends was Spiro Agnew. So who knows? Benny was a little bit all over the place. But <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, racism... Was Spiro Agnew... Um right-wing racist idiot sure yeah i mean he was uh one of the people <clears throat> who kind of thought that the murder of the four students at kent state was justified okay you know so he was total a total reactionary and it was weird because uh, and nixon as well a lot of these comedians you know they grew up poor uneducated so the idea that they would get to a place where they could cozy up to power was very alluring bob hope is the most famous example 
But Richard Nixon, who we know now is like a famous anti-Semite, was sponsored at the Hillcrest Country Club, an old Jewish country club, um, to join the membership. And there's like a famous photo of Jack Benny, Joey Bishop, Danny Thomas, George Jessel with Richard Nixon at the Hillcrest uh, uh, Country Club. So I think they like the idea of being able to cozy up to presidents and vice presidents and dignitaries, regardless of their a political point of view. It was more like an insecurity on their part. But Jack Benny in the 40s and 50s and 60s, yeah, kind of an enlightened guy as far as race relations were concerned. And Eddie uh, Rochester Anderson was sort of his sidekick on the radio show and the TV show. Played his manservant, so he was still playing like a servile role, but it was a great switch compared to like the Hattie McDaniels or the Butterfly McQueens who were always subservient. Uh, Eddie Rochester Anderson on the Jack Benny program always got the best of Jack Benny. Uh, The butt of the joke was always the white guy. And Eddie Rochester Anderson was the superior one. And that never really happened in comedy when you had a black character and a white character, or even in drama in the 30s and 40s uh, films in Hollywood. So Jack Benny, uh, in that regard, was kind of ahead of his time and paid Eddie Anderson better than any other black actor in America. At one point, Rochester was the wealthiest uh, African-American person in uh, show business uh, during the 1940s and 50s. Um, but yeah, he refused to, uh, perform in South Africa. And in fact, I think he fired his manager who had booked that tour for him. He goes, what are you doing? This was in the sixties, early sixties. And so apartheid wasn't even like a hot button issue in America, like it would be in the 1980s. So it was sort of a interesting, um, yeah, a little factoid about Jack, but he was, just, he was a very smart guy. I did not know that. Well, you know, there's so many people that, um, need to give credit to like the, uh, the mob essentially created the term stand-up comic. Yeah, this is according to an elderly man named Dick Curtis, who's still <clears throat> alive. I think he's in his 90s. Had a very um, ambling career, never became a star, but uh, appeared on a famous episode of the Dick Van Dyke show called Coast to Coast Big Mouth as a game show host. Um, he says that uh, the phrase stand-up comes from the mafia because the mob uh, ran the boxing racket and... Uh, boxer that the mob controlled who could take punishment and not fall down even though he was getting beaten to a pulp was considered a stand-up fighter and a person that you could rely on who wouldn't snitch who wouldn't talk about mob activities was considered a stand-up guy so a comedian that performed in mob run nightclubs who could keep his mouth shut who wouldn't squeal who wouldn't rat and who was reliable as a performer was considered a stand-up comic And so that entered the lexicon in the late 40s, right at the height of mob run nightclubs. And I think the first published reference to the phrase stand-up comedian is on the back of a Mort Saul uh, record on the liner notes, like in the late 50s. But apparently the phrase was in common usage as a colloquial uh, usage just in conversation uh, up to that point. But that's according to this guy, Dick Curtis. I love it. A a, A stand up fighter is a guy that is a puncher. I yeah, love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm a boxing enthusiast. I love comedy. <clears throat> I, I, that makes me so happy. Yeah, the connection. Yeah, for sure. And apparently the show business was a lot better when the mob was running it. That they. Well, it was a lot more personal. <clears throat> it was a lot less uh, corporate. There's incredible parallels between the mafia running anything and corporations running anything. So right now in America, we have corporations in control of the government and they're ramrodding everything through that they want through for their own sake, regardless of objection or protest. And that's how the mafia operated, too. And whenever the mafia was accused of wrongdoing, they would say, go, hey, we're operating a legitimate business here. Corporations, the same thing. They try and ramrod uh, immoral legislation through. They go, hey, it's not illegal. We're not doing anything. Well, it's because they purchased the legislator and and now they're doing their bidding on their behalf. The mafia would do the same thing. So there's very similar parallels. However, one of the big differences is how personal the mafia was. You knew these guys by name and you could talk to them and you could drink with them. But you're never going to have a drink with the CEO of Pfizer. You know, there's a distance to it. So Las Vegas, when it was run by the mob, comedians tended to prefer it because it was a more personal thing. If you had an issue, you can talk to somebody directly and they would take care of it. Whereas now um, it's all about the profit margin. So when the mafia ran things, if you were a comedian, you get free meals, free drinks, free girls. Now you get a favors. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) 
Heckler's Whereas, were taken care of yeah. in a very discreet manner. Yeah, yeah. So you don't get that anymore. Now you get a, a, a bill for 40% off your sandwich. The, this is great. The, the Lenny Bruce joke that um, Chicago, because the Chicago clubs were run by the mafia. Lenny Bruce joked that Chicago was the only city where death certificates listed a cause of death as he wouldn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> There, you quoted a joke. I did. That's I, the, funny. The jokes that I did quote were the ones that I felt would uh, translate the, well to print. The borscht belt, Jerry Lewis said, because you'd get borscht and dairy products at lunch and meat at dinner. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, another thing I learned, I don't want to go through everything, but just the, the things I, I loved the most, like did um, uh, Jack Roy smoking pot. I, when I was a teenager, Rodney Dangerfield was my all-time hero Mm -hmm. i had memorized every joke and he's notoriously was a huge weed smoker Mm -hmm. so how did you unearth that little tid well well, i'm fascinated by anybody's uh smoking pot in an era when it wasn't popular or common so pre-60s like only yeah only black jazz musicians yeah i find all of that fascinating red fox before he was famous was arrested with two pounds of marijuana. He was emceeing at some jazz club in New York and uh, the club was raided. The drummer was arrested. The dishwasher was arrested. Red Fox was arrested and his wife was arrested. And there's a blurb from Variety, I think 1948, 49, that says, friends always wondered how Fred Foxy Sanford could afford two Cadillacs Cadillacs on his meager uh, income. Uh, you know, and then it goes on to say the police busted him. They opened up the trunk of his car. They found pounds of marijuana and a bunch of knives. Um, and I, I just find that so interesting because it's so common now. It's not a big deal to smoke pot. But back then, you were putting your life in your hands. You know, you'd be thrown away for for decades. And if you it was were, considered like heroin or like a yeah, like a federal offense yeah. to be, you would also be defamed in the press. <clears throat> you know, it would say junkie addict. You know, it would it would just totally. Um, your reputation would just be totally destroyed. So I found all of that fascinating. And Rodney Dangerfield, in his memoir, talks about his first time getting stoned changed his whole life. And it was him and Joe E. Ross, who was the ooh, ooh guy in Car 54, Where Are You? and The Phil Silver Show, um, who he got stoned with for the first time. So I found that sort of connection fascinating. There was a guy named Tommy Mo Raft who got Lenny Bruce stoned for the first time and Tommy Mo Raft was a burlesque comedian and the burlesque comics were considered sort of the lower echelon of show business and so drug use was often more frequent in the burlesque clubs for comedians the same way it would be like in a strip club you know so all of that I find quite compelling and then in later years Rodney Dangerfield became the very first a possessor of a medical legal medical marijuana card in the state of California. He was number one. The first one. Come on. Yeah. yeah. How do you know that? Yeah. It's it's, it's well known. There's a <clears throat> there's a letter you can find on his website. Um, he was serial number zero zero yeah. zero one. <laughs> That's right. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When he was living in Westwood in his uh, his big apartment there. Yeah. 1990 <clears throat> something. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, speaking of Red Fox, is another interesting thing in there that I didn't know uh, he was buddies with with Malcolm X and that they had some Red Fox knew a girl that ran a uh, a dry cleaning place and they would steal like a hundred suits and then sell them yeah she worked at the dry cleaning place she wasn't the manager but she would leave it unlocked at night Malcolm X and Red Fox would go in there steal all the suits that people had dropped off to get cleaned take them up to the roof um, and then sell them for cut rate prices. And that's how they made their living. And uh, at the time, Malcolm X and Red Fox were not known under those uh, monikers, but they're both known as, uh, as Harlem street hustlers in the uh, late 1940s. And then they drifted apart and went on to their own individual uh, careers. But Red Fox's trajectory. It's too bad Malcolm X never got to live to see Sanford and Son. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's too bad he didn't live, period. But yeah. yeah. Um, Red Fox's story could be a movie. For sure, I, know. I didn't know, and it should be the um, just his uh, erotic jewelry collection alone is 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 worth. Uh, I didn't know about this. Yeah, he had erotic jewelry. Um, he when he went bankrupt, he had to sell a lot of stuff, but he had right. personalized yeah. different, you know, diamond encrusted uh, whatever. But I didn't know he basically invented the genre of. 
uh, comedy albums. Totally. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Stand-up comedy records to make a distinction. Every now and then a nerd will come up to me and go, well, what about Spike Jones and his city slicker? I go, well, that was, you know, musical novelty stuff. And there were some 78s in the 20s of Burt Williams um, doing routines, but they were songs. And Sam and Henry, who were a precursor to Amos and Andy, their radio shows were on 78. But in terms of stand-up comedy records, which is what we usually think of now as a comedy record, Red Fox was the very first. 1956, Dudo Records, which was a great rhythm and blues label in South Central uh, Los Angeles, run by a, a black guy named uh, Dootsie Williams, who had made a fortune. Dootsie? Produ- Dootsie, yeah. D O O T S I E. And uh, he had produced uh, a bunch of doo wop hits. The most famous was Earth Angel by the Penguins. And so that was such a huge pop hit that it gave him the freedom to experiment. He would see Red Fox emceeing shows in South Central Los Angeles and said, you know, I think uh, we should record your act and release it as a record, which was unheard of at the time. And Red Fox said, no, because if you release my act and people hear it, then they're not going to come and see me live because they'll have heard my act. And my jokes won't get laughs because people will be familiar with them. So he said no initially. But then Red Fox a week later uh, was broke and needed money. So he went back to Dootsie Williams and said, hey, let's let's record the record. And so between 56 and 58, uh, he released something like, I used to know the number, I forget. I think it was 14 albums, 10 LPs and four EPs of just Red Fox doing stand-up. But because it was a black label and it was sort of underground, he never really got the credit. In 1958, Mort Saul came out with a record on Verve, and it was proclaimed as the first stand-up comedy record. And then Woody Woodbury uh, came out with an adults-only comedy record in 1959, stand-up, and uh, uh, Shelley Berman in 1959 came out with his first record. And all of those guys proclaimed that they were the first person to do a comedy record. Mort Saul said, I was the first. Shelley Berman said, I was the first. Woody Woodbury said, I was the first. But Red Fox was the first and had them beat by 14 releases. But he was not in the mainstream the same way these guys were. So they always got the credit. But if you go back and look at the Cashbox magazines or Billboard magazines that uh, uh, timestamp when these things were released, Red Fox was the first person to release a stand-up comedy record. And they were so successful. They were huge sellers that over the course of the next 20 years, he had something like 100 records on the market. A lot of it was repackaged material, but um, more comedy LPs than anybody in the history of comedy, Red Fox. Amazing. I have uh, several of them. Yeah, there's so many. And uh, it's amazing that people would actually at a party go, okay, we're going to, they were, they were called party records Mm -hmm. and and people would go, you should imagine in like the, you know, late fifties, early sixties, everybody smashed drinking (laughs) cocktails and hard liquor. Okay. Everybody be quiet. We're going to play a comedy record. Yeah. And then they're all sitting around smoking cigarettes, listening to it. There's a throwaway line in an episode of the Dick Van Dyke show where I, I, can't, I think it's Maury Amsterdam saying, Dick, why don't you come over, or Rob, why don't you come over to my house later? I got a new comedy record. you know. And it's not meant as a gag line or anything, but it's just an interesting glimpse into that era, that universe, that that was a thing, which makes total sense. I mean, can you imagine hearing the 2,000-year-old man for the first time? I, I mean, that would be a great party. you know. I, right, and they didn't have Netflix and comedy specials and that that was, yeah. you know, man, I could use a laugh. Let's... Yeah. Uh, and they did call them party records. I'll be I, the life of the party. I'll bring this record. Well, I think the reason that they're called party records even predates the idea of having a party. Because Red Fox's very first stand-up comedy record is called Laugh of the Party. And then he, his second one was Laugh of the Party Volume 2. And then there was 10 volumes, Laugh of the Party. So I think maybe <clears throat> it was originally a reference to Red Fox's record, specifically Party Record, because the first 10 albums were called Laugh of the Party. That's speculation, but I think it may have come from that originally. Do you have a favorite Red Fox joke? No. Okay. No, I don't. But I love uh, just the sort of mystique of Red Fox as a whole. You know, here's this guy who's hosting shows, black burlesque shows, jazz clubs. Johnny Otis, who is very important to rhythm and blues music in Los Angeles, who was a Greek guy pretending to be black, um, had one of the top radio shows in Los Angeles and... Uh, Greek guy pretending to be black. I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't let that yeah. that sentence go by. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he had the same facial hair as Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa based his facial hair on Johnny Otis's facial huh. hair, the mustache and the little uh, soul patch. And he sounded like a black man when you heard him on the radio, sort of like Wolfman Jack later. And uh, everybody thought he was black until 
it came out that he wasn't right around the time of the Watts riots and Johnny Otis went down there to try and like calm people down and they just wouldn't listen to him. He had been a real pillar of the community for a long time, but when they found out that he was just a fan of black culture. So uh, the Watts riots exposed him. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It, it kind of harmed his credibility because for 20 years he'd been considered like a voice of the black community. And he was. He, like, he was a real progressive guy and a real champion of of uh, uh, equality. But the fact that he had, you know, um, turned out to just be a Greek guy who never copped to being a Greek, Greek guy kind of harmed his reputation. But I can't remember what my point was. Okay. He he had a lot to do with Red Fox's early career. He would let Red Fox come on the radio late at night and just talk for like four or five hours. He'd bring Slappy White on. They'd play records by uh, 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 Big Mama Thornton and uh, Big Mama Thornton. Yeah, all, nice. all these sort of blues. So that's who, who originally did Hound Dog? Hound Dog. Elvis. That's right. Yeah, Presley had the big hit with. That's right. Um, and I think Johnny Otis was the one who to break that uh, song. He broke a lot of the big songs. There's a song called Hand Jive, which sort of sounds like a ripoff of Bo Diddley, um, that Johnny Otis uh, released. And he had a KTLA regional TV show that was all black acts. There's only one episode that exists. You can find it on YouTube, but really important in breaking uh, some important rhythm and blues acts. And Red Fox was part of that universe as a comedian. He was like comedy's representative in 1950s soul music, doo-wop music, rhythm and blues music, early rock and roll, and the jazz world. And so for that reason alone, I find him to be such a fascinating, interesting cog. People talk about Lenny Bruce and his connection to that universe. But here's Red Fox, a black man in the 1950s, had he been white, probably would have been more famous than Lenny Bruce, but and was uh, probably equally as uh, as controversial and dirty. A guy named Gene Norman, who ran the Crescendo Club on on the Sunset Strip, where Woody Allen would perform and Shelley Berman, a lot of records were perform or were recorded there. Dave Brubeck, um, he said that he did not have half as much trouble with Lenny Bruce and the Vice Squad as he did with Red Fox. Because Red Fox was far dirtier on stage at the Crescendo, and they had to stop booking him. And a lot of that history happened on La Cienega Boulevard, right? Uh, well, later... The, I learned that from your book, where that restaurant row is, yeah. was where all these nightclubs were. Well, later on, when Red Fox uh, started to make money, he, in 1966, he became the first black headliner at a Las Vegas uh, hotel, or black headlining comedian at a Las Vegas hotel. The Aladdin opened in 66, and started booking a lot of black acts like uh, Godfrey Cambridge and Red Fox was one of them and so he made all this money in 66 in Las Vegas it gave him enough money to buy a business in 67 on Restaurant Row on La Cienega Boulevard it was an old club called the Slate Brothers Club where coincidentally Lenny Bruce had performed in the late 50s and Red Fox bought it and turned it into the Red Fox Club and it was a financial disaster. Red Fox was really bad with money, and that's why he had to sell everything later on, like all that jewelry. He got in trouble with the IRS. But he ran a club on La Cienega Boulevard and was the first black business owner in uh, Beverly Hills. So Red Fox has a lot of historical distinctions. The first person to release a stand-up comedy record, the first uh, black comedian to headline a Vegas hotel, and the first black business owner in uh, Beverly Hills. So really like a groundbreaking guy who never really gets his his due or his credit. We just remember him for Sanford and Son. But. Gets his due for me. I mean, I was a kid watching Sanford and Son. I loved it. Yeah. And I called my dad Pop because <laughs> I loved that show so much. Yeah. And then I learned about Red Fox as I became a student of stand-up comedy. Um, can I lay my favorite Red Fox sure. joke on sure, you? please. I believe this is from the album You Gotta Wash Your Ass, <laughs> yeah. which came out in like 1978. Um, I went to Tijuana and I rented a car and I'm driving around Tijuana, Mexico and I accidentally ran over this guy and I killed him. I was in court and the judge said, Mr. Fox, did you see the man standing in the street with his tamale wagon? I said, Your Honor, I didn't even notice that his fly was open. <laughs> I love that. Standing in the street with his tamale. Right? <laughs> That's hilarious. That, that is the Parthenon of dick jokes. That's great. I think. Jack Carter told me his favorite Red Fox joke, which was, uh, uh, My wife told me to kiss her where it smells. So I took her to El Segundo. 
Yeah. That's why I always, over when I go to the airport or when I'm driving, uh, that go by South Central LA or, or when you're on the 405 and you see exits for El Segundo, it always makes me smile. Yeah. Because when, when Red Fox ever got any money in Sanford and Son, he was going to El Segundo. Yeah. Yeah. That was like, it just seemed like his magic place. <laughs> I, lo- I love those <laughs> references. That's one of the fun things about living in Hollywood is catching all the references I had heard all my life, like Cucamonga. Yeah. And Jack Benny. Rancho Cucamonga. Yeah, you'd hear that and it would make you laugh and you had no point of reference for it. Yeah. And then now well, to have in, a point of even reference. Even in the you. Bukowski books, he, um, uh, you know, that um, uh, d- there's a, there's one poem where he talks about Catella. Uh, did you did you win at the horse track today, Catella? And that's like a, a street name in Los Angeles. There's different right. street names that Bukowski used as character names and things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dragnet as well. You watch old reruns of Dragnet, you know, and they make references to streets. And you can tell now when you watch, you go, well, that's not a real street number. Like, they'll add three numbers to the to the street location on La Brea so that it's not an actual place. But. Right, like there's uh, every English person, John Cooper Clark told me this, um, and he wanted to find it. There was a, a TV show in the 50s. It's like 667 Sunset Boulevard. That was a TV show. And so like every English person of a certain age when they come, and it's not actually an right. address. 77 Sunset Street. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And they had a famous so- theme song, real catchy theme song, 77 Sunset Strip. And then there's nothing actually there. And actually, their establishing shot was of uh, Dean Martin's restaurant, Dino's Lodge. Hmm. But for that TV show, even though it existed on the Sunset Strip, they built a facsimile on the Warner Brothers lot in Burbank. So the opening theme, it's they pull up in front of that restaurant. I don't know why they wouldn't just use the actual restaurant, but they built like an exact replica of the Dean Martin sign and stuff and used it in that TV show. But I love that idea. We were talking about this before we started. When you travel, how it adds context to, to everything. Now when you read a book that takes place in a certain city, that book becomes better because you can kind of picture the ambiance now that you've been there, you know. Um, I just went to Nashville for the first time and I had like the time of my life. There. Great city. So much fun and uh, music everywhere, but it just gave me context uh, uh, for everything because I grew up loving uh, country and western music. I was uh, that's great because like when I go to Nashville, I always think like when I'm driving around, I always think I'll be taking a right turn and I'll think, man, Hank Williams took this right turn. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it, there's something about. I wonder what that is. There's got to be a psychology to it. It's more than just being a nerd. There's some kind of psychology to it that kind of sets off like a little bit of an endorphin in your head. The fact that my hero was here and now I'm here. That kind of connection, whatever that is, it is very uh, exhilarating. It's gratifying in a way. I did the nerdiest thing I've done in my life when I went to Nashville. I went to a radio tower where WSM Radio has their radio tower because when they built this radio tower, it was the tallest radio tower in the world. And it's the reason country music and country and Western became famous. The radio tower was so potent that you could hear the Grand Ole Opry in Toronto. You could hear the Grand Ole Opry in California because of this potent radio tower. So specifically because of that technology. In California, it could reach over the Rockies? Well, in those days, 1924, 25, when the Grand Ole Opry started, and I think that tower was built in the late 20s, there were not as many uh, radio stations. So you could reach it without interference. At night, the radio waves would not be blockaded by a competing radio wave. So for that reason, people could pick it up all over the place. And it's what made all of those country stars famous, that radio tower. So that radio tower is still there. So I went out and took a photo because I'm a moron. And it was funny. I took an Uber over there. Or I took an Uber there and an Uber back. The Uber back was with like a young guy. He goes, "What, what the fuck are you doing in this neighborhood by a turnpike? Standing on, there's like not even a place for me to pull over. I go, oh, I was taking a photo of this WSM radio <laughs> tower. The guy who drove me there in my Uber, though, was like 70. He goes, ah, you must be headed to the WSM radio tower. <laughs> like he knew exactly what it was. But I don't think that's weird because I was in San Antonio, Texas two weeks ago. And I had to go to the Gunter Hotel to stand in front of the door of room 414, which is where Robert Johnson did his very first 
recording session Amazing. in November 1936. Amazing. So, Amazing. so you going to see a tower in in Nashville isn't that um, bizarre to me? Yeah, but but it is a, pretty nerdy. Yeah, I mean, I but I I think but life the, life is about nerdy pilgrimages. It's it's a great excuse. Did you go find Hank Williams' house? Where he lived? No, I went to uh, uh, some places that were definitely, I can't imagine anybody else doing them. I went to a place that used to be the headquarters of Star Day Records. And while Sun Records is super famous, for whatever reason, Star Day is not. But they were kind of joined at the hip. They did a very similar thing. They both started as sort of down-home country labels. Then they saw uh, this sort of shift happening with the popularity of rock and roll. And they both kind of went into the rockabilly field. And Starday Records was this great label. If you ever are in a record store, you see anything with that label, Starday, buy it. It's going to be good. They would uh, record people on their way up, like George Jones before he was famous, Roger Miller before he was famous, or people on their way down. Hawkshaw, Hawkins, Moon Mullican, all these people that uh, had been famous decades earlier. And they popularized uh, bluegrass for the modern era in the early 60s. The guy who ran Starday felt bad for all these bluegrass guys who'd been around in the 30s. That style of music wasn't popular. So he recorded them all while they were still alive and reissued all their records in the 60s. And it created a bluegrass resurgence with the young folkies um, who started to listen to that stuff and cover that stuff. So where Starday Records was located, the address is on the back of all those records. I looked on Google Street View. It's still there. I had a photo from the 50s with a uh, like a fancy uh, Chevy 57 Chevy parked in front of it I was like oh I gotta go there it's still there but it's in like a weird neighborhood where it's all mechanic shops and stuff like that and the building's there and the roof is caved in and it's all water damaged and I went there and took photos and then some guy from the mechanic shop came out with like a gun and said what are you what are you snooping around here for I said oh it's a start because I'm the one guy who gives a fuck about this location <laughs> <laughs> so you put your gun away, you fucking hayseed. Yeah. I, well, we were talking about it, and I go, I'm surprised this place hasn't been uh, knocked down. He goes, yeah, I wish they would. You know, for some reason, he it's like an eyesore, you know. He's like the junkyard guy in uh, Stand By Me. <laughs> loony, loony, loony. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I'm the one guy who cares about this spot. <laughs> but I love that. Uh, there were still remnants of old uh, Nashville there. Because I'd heard from a lot of people who had been there over the years or who had lived there. He goes, ah, it's not like it used to be. Everybody says that about everywhere. Yeah. And it is true about It's everywhere. true, but I like I've But never it hasn't been, been... Austin kind of got overgrown and people moved there and the rents have gone crazy and there, there is, you know, the population explosion where I think all the cool people are moving to Nashville now. And I think it still has a good 10 or 20 years before it's ruined. Yeah. Well, it's still it's still great. Yeah. There's no question that there's still all kinds of uh, new condo uh, eyesores and all that kind of thing. But for somebody who had never been there before, it was easy for me to spot all the old stuff. I was like, oh, wow, this place is still here. And uh, and the, the, the Country Music Hall of Fame is is excellently done. Yeah. And the Ryman Auditorium still there. Robert's Western World, the sign on uh, Ernest Tubbs Record Shop, all these sort of iconic little places and then the musicians are unbelievable like it's un- everywhere did un- you go to the bluebird cafe i did and i did go just, there it, it just um just singer songwriters performing in every corner of every restaurant it's so cool it's it's really cool. I, w- I walked into one place based on what i heard echoing onto the street i was like i could hear somebody doing a guitar solo i go what is that and i walked in and it was just this incredible guitar player on stage somebody a friend of mine who used to live there said yeah you it, charlatans don't last long in Nashville. If you don't yeah. really know how to play, you're you're out of there quick. You know, you have to be the best of the best. And I found that amazing because it was not the one thing I feared is that I would go and it would all be the sort of new style of what they new call new country. Yeah, which I hate. New country. Yeah, it all sounds like a happy shampoo commercial. It is all. It's just and it's, everything's about. Is everything's about drinking? Every every male uh, country act. I mean, I, I don't pay attention to it. I listen to old country, yeah. and uh, but it's always it's about your truck or like I'm getting drunk this weekend. It's like well, it's also very overproduced. You know, it's sort of like a white noise, like rock was in the in the early '90s, late '80s. It almost it period. almost sounds the same as that. It has no uh, similarity, other than maybe somebody affecting a southern accent. It has no similarity to what we know as the roots of country and western. And early country and western 
sounds a lot like the blues. Like you have a Lightning Hopkins. It was the white man's blues, yeah. It was, and this is something I learned recently. There's a great book called The Nashville Sound by a guy named Paul Hempel from 1968. Great book. Um, and there's a section in the book where he talks about how all the early uh, white country stars learned to play music from uh, black people. So even country and western has its roots in uh, in black music. Hank Williams, learned, who I'm a huge fan of, and I, I still listen. Uh, Hank Williams is one of my uh, perennials. And Hank Williams learned to, and I've read two of his biographies, he learned how to play from a homeless black man on the streets of Montgomery, Alabama. Right. The 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 guy taught him, it, which transformed his life from being a a, a little white uh, hayseed farmer kid into being a worldwide entertainer. To- totally. Hey. There's also a guy named uh, DeFord Bailey. DeFord Bailey was the first big star produced by the Grand Ole Opry around 24, 25. He was a harmonica player and he was black. He was the first African-American uh, to play the Grand Ole Opry and the last African-American to play the Grand Ole Opry until Charlie Pride. Um, but you listen to him and it sounds like blues music. You know, it's it's a little bit more upbeat than blues music, a little bit faster. That's kind of the differentiation. But he was a star of the Grand Ole Opry. And so all this white uh, country music that followed was influenced by black music. And a lot of early 30s music, a lot of stuff like Lead Belly in the 40s or Lightning Hopkins in the 40s sounds a lot like Jimmy Rogers in the early 30s, the singing brakeman who Johnny Cash always said is kind of the grandpappy of us all in country and western. There's a very strong similarity between the blues and country. I think, uh, and I've, I've uh, which is interesting, the three Jimmy Rogers albums that I have, uh, there was a, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, this good friend of mine, Jamaican Johnny, who was um, from Jamaica, which is why we called him Jamaican Johnny. His mother, <clears throat> little old black woman from um, Jamaica, was a huge um, country fan. And Jimmy Rogers was her favorite. And um, when she died, he let me have her Jimmy Rogers oh, records. Cool. I think the similarity in the sound is due to uh, rail travel. Because they were that that kind of um, uh, rhythm um, stroke on the guitar kind of emulates the sound of the the train on the track, mm-hmm. don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I never thought of it, but absolutely. I mean, the hobo lifestyle was grown out of the <clears throat> initial Great Depression prior to the 1930s. There was a depression in the 1890s, an Industrial Revolution era depression. People looking for jobs and uh, just like now, so much of poverty was concentrated in, in the black community. So there was thousands of black hobos roving the country and riding the ro- rails, just like there were uh, uh, poor white people. And music was a big, big part of it, you know, just like in slave times. Music was the thing that kept people who had nothing to live for uh, kind of going. You know, it helped you pass the time and uh, distract yourself from the misery. So who are your... Uh, who, who are your favorite old country? Oh, God, I have so many. Uh, well, that, like I said, anything on that Star Day label, I love. And this is the stuff that you listen to primarily now? I read a book uh, on the history of Star Day uh, a little while ago, and it's amazing. It's an amazing era to live in because of YouTube. I used to read books about music in the 90s, pre YouTube. What a waste Couldn't of time. See anything, yeah. What a waste of time. I read a book once in the 90s on the history of Chicago doo-wop. Even while I was reading it, I go, why am I reading this? Yeah. He's, they're describing things I can't find or hear. What's the point? But now there's a whole YouTube channel, just a guy who uploads records from Star Day Records. So no shit. Read the book, listened to all the tracks. George Jones, before he was famous, he was recording for Star Day, and Star Day saw that Rockabilly was becoming popular. Elvis had become popular. So George Jones recorded a whole series of 45s for them as uh, Thumper Jones, and it's Rockabilly by uh, George Jones. Doesn't sound anything like him, and it's just great. You know, it's just the greatest stuff. But initially, when I got into country and western, it was through my father. So it was all the standard fellas like Merle Haggard and ladies like Dottie West and Loretta Lynn. Um, I'm really interested in a lot of the songwriters. Tom T. Hall is a great songwriter. He wrote one song I don't like, his most famous song. It's very common in show business. The thing that you're most famous for is often 
your worst work becomes yeah. the most popular. <clears throat> And uh, Tom T. Hall wrote uh, Harper Valley PTA, which oh my God. nobody likes yeah. for good reason. But he wrote all kinds of other s- songs like um, uh, Maggie's at the Lincoln Park Inn, which is another one of these songs that's got like a long, uh, obtuse story to it, like 40 verses, you know. But it's not about the, the stupid story. It's about... That's like the Affair Motel type of yeah, thing? That's yeah, such a- yeah. And uh, so I really like the songs of Tom T. Hall, John D. Laddermilk, who just died... Uh, wrote so many huge hits for so many people never really got the credit i love anything written by john d Loudermilk, uh willie nelson obviously you know um yeah i I, basically anything from the 50s and 60s in fact in all popular music there's very little i don't like from the 50s and 60s whether it's jazz music country and western rock and roll blues soul music doo-wop music garage rock psychedelic rock that period from 50 to 70 uh, for me, with the exception of maybe Pat Boone, is uh, flawless. <laughs> <laughs> Any way you slice it. Um, you talking about YouTube, there there was a, a great um, uh, Jack Dempsey book, Jack, Jack Dempsey in the Roaring Twenties, um, and about his, his boxing career. And the great thing about that book is I could, as I read the book, go and watch right. each fight yeah. from like, you know, 1906 to 1927 or whatever it was so it it is incredible it's a great i hear from people that that's how they read my book as well they read a reference to a comedian they go on youtube they watch the footage you know i I quote gene carroll in the book a pioneering female stand-up and you can watch a couple clips of her stand-up online you know it also shows you books that were written in the 70s memoirs and biographies how full of shit some people were. They'll describe a thing that you th- they thought nobody would ever have access to, something that happened on TV in 1951. Right. Then you go and watch it on YouTube, you're like, that's not how it happened at all. <laughs> this guy was totally making up a self-aggrandizing story about something else, you know. But uh, I love that. I love the fact that I can read and research kind of simultaneously in the internet age. It's a better era to read now because of that, even though nobody reads anymore. Well, I just want to bring up a few more things about the book. The, the Another thing I learned that Shecky Green was like Lenny Bruce's favorite comedian and he was edgy and dangerous. Mm-hmm. She- where to us in the modern age, the name Shecky Green is like kind of a euphemism for a hack comedian. Yeah, it's totally a euphemism and nobody knows anything about Shecky Green. You know, it's such a strange phenomenon that everybody would know the name and not the man. You know, I guess that's not uncommon you hear people reference like slappy white it's just like a it's such a uh yeah jingoistic uh name slappy shecky yeah it's yeah. maybe because it sounds like sticky or hacky yeah you know? but uh shecky green in the 50s and 60s was considered one of the most inventive guys he didn't do uh much written material which is one of the reasons his act didn't become famous beyond nightclubs you know when he did tv it didn't go very well because he wasn't that kind of an act he was more of an improviser on stage but the people that counted him as the greatest comedian included uh, lenny bruce jack benny ernie kovacs um i mean those three right there are three completely different genres of comedy ernie kovacs an experimental tv comedian jack benny a traditional and widely respected comedian and lenny bruce this sort of new subversive comedian they all said shecky green was the funniest guy and even when I interviewed old timers to like describe Shecky Green's act, they couldn't really. Pat Cooper said, I once saw Shecky Green do three hours. I'd never seen him do before or since. He climbed to the top of the curtain in Caesar's Palace and did 20 minutes while he was hanging from the top of the curtain. He just destroyed. And all the comedians said that when they finished their last show of the night in Las Vegas, two in the morning, they would go to wherever Shecky Green was performing, the Tropicana, the Riviera. And he was a comics comic. All the comedians wanted to see what Shecky Green was going to do. Sometimes he would get arrested, not because of his language, but because he was out in the audience, like causing trouble, flipping over tables or pushing over uh, slot machines or the, the arguing with the owner of the club, like in front of everybody as part of his act, making fun of the guy, dressing him down. Mafia guys, he'd dress them down, get big laughs. And he was an alcoholic. He was a huge, huge, huge boozer. Uh, Pete Barbuti told me that Shecky could not go on stage unless he was wasted drunk. Um, he was too nervous. He would drink. He would go up. He was fearless. Then we'd get off stage and he would weep. He would cry. There was something about the adrenaline that just kind of like overwhelmed him. 
but he could perform for two, three hours at a, at, a, at a time, and nobody else could really do that in those days and kill the whole time. Uh, but there's no real strong record of his act in terms of what he was doing. He was a great impressionist. He wasn't known as an impressionist, sort of like Norm Macdonald can do great impressions, but nobody calls him an impressionist. Uh, Shecky Green did hilarious impressions of his fellow comedians. He did a hilarious impression of Shelley Berman. He did a hilarious impression of Danny Thomas. So he was just a very inventive guy, and he's still alive. He's, he's still alive. He's, he lives in <clears throat> Palm Springs, and it's amazing. He was a headliner in Las Vegas in the 50s and 60s, and there was no place you could make more money as a comedian than as a headliner in Las Vegas in those days. Like You made a ton of money, and if you invested correctly, you could live well for the rest of your life. I became friendly with Jack Carter before he died, and he had a nice place in Beverly Hills. And people would ask me, like, how does he survive? I go, he was a headliner in Vegas in the 50s and 60s, put it all into real estate. He's sitting pretty. Shecky Green lost $3 million in the Jack Abramoff scandal like oh, no. six or seven years ago. And I said to him when I interviewed him, I go, you lo- are you okay? Like $3 million? He goes, he goes ah, yeah, guy was a scumbag, but ah, I'm fine. At the age of 80-something, he loses $3 million, hasn't worked in 30 years, and he's fine. So that gives you an idea of the amount of money he was making uh, in the mid-century in Las Vegas. There's a Bob Dylan on Theme Time uh, Radio. Mm -hmm. I think it was the drinking episode where he talked about Checky Green, where when he gave up drinking, he couldn't perform anymore. Yeah. And it it took years of um, therapy or something before he could ever even get on stage again. Yeah, I guess he he always had stage fright, and the booze took away the stage fright to an extent. Um, also, a lot of these guys were kind of bipolar in an era when that wasn't diagnosed. So Buddy Hackett was considered insane. Shecky Green was considered insane. But by the 80s and 90s, uh, they were medicated, so they were less insane, but they also performed less. They're also older, but um, they were known for errant behavior. And Shecky Green's probably most famous incident was when he was drunk at the end of a night the valet gave him his car and he sped down uh the vegas strip at 100 miles an hour on the wrong side of the road lost control crashed into caesar's palace which had just been built and knocked over all those fake greek columns and uh they crashed across the side of his uh hood and his car ended up teetering inside the fountains at caesar's palace and he didn't get charged with anything, didn't get arrested. The cops showed up and they said, oh, well, that's Shecky. And that was it. So, like, there was no ramification for endangering, <laughs> you know, everybody. Just being a, a violent, drunk yeah, lunatic. Yeah, And another thing you mentioned in the book that uh, Buddy Hackett was also one of Lenny Bruce's favorite comedians. And um, he would shoot up automobiles that parked in his parking spot in yeah, Vegas. Like, there's a, there's I a, had no idea because you, you see, you know, when I was growing up, you'd see Buddy Hackett on TV and you're like, oh, there's the, the portly guy with the lisp. Yeah, you go, everybody... oh, yeah, he was in Herbie the Love Bug movies, right. Disney movies. <clears throat> yeah, he was a lunatic. Um, Buddy Hackett loved firearms and always carried guns around and would shoot things up. He hated Toadie Fields for some reason and there's a story that he was sitting in the green room at the Tropicana and there was a headshot of Tony Fields on the wall and Buddy Hackett you know was yelling ranting and raving about her he was in the green room before he had to go on he was sitting with a couple other comics Buddy took out his gun and shot Tony Fields uh, headshot off the wall because he hated her so much and uh, yeah there's a famous story about his uh, he showed up I guess I don't know which hotel it was, but Buddy Hackett was a star. He was a headliner at the at the hotel in Las Vegas, and somebody had parked in his parking space. So he was livid. So he gets out of his car, takes out his gun, shoots out all four of the tires and both windshields of this car that parked in his spot. Most people would have, you know, went and complained to the manager, somebody's parked in my spot. Now, not only did he shoot up all four of the tires and the two uh, windshields, he reloaded his gun and then shot it up again, you know. So that was that was Buddy Hack. And then he went on stage and did his act like nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew he was such an out-of-control lunatic? Yeah. And he and Lenny Bruce uh, started out together before they were famous. In, uh, and so Lenny Bruce would run and see him perform. Yeah, well, they used to smoke pot together. Buddy Hackett was a big pothead early on. And uh, Lenny Bruce and Buddy Hacker would sometimes trade material. They were both known as being dirty comedians. 
But Bunny Hackett was more ambitious, maybe, than Lenny. Lenny was more of the purist. It was about the moment, you know, getting those laughs and being a truth teller, whereas Buddy Hackett wanted to be uh, famous. So by 1956, 7, he started his own live sitcom called uh, Stanley, produced by Max Liebman, who had also produced your show of shows for Sid Caesar. And Buddy Hackett got his first uh, taste of fame. And Lenny Bruce, around the time, was getting his first taste of controversy and vice squad visits and then eventually a drug addiction. And Buddy Hackett said, you know, Lenny, if you're going to be getting arrested, I can't hang out with you anymore. It's not going to be good for my career or my reputation. I got to go start hanging out with Alan King and play golf. I can't be hanging out with a heroin addict, you know? <laughs> and that's exactly what he what happened. He I'm dis- just the shoot up the car guy. I'm yeah. not the heroin needle guy. <laughs> yeah, don't- <laughs> I got to draw the line. <laughs> And so, in a way, it was kind of sad because when Lenny Bruce started getting arrested, he needed help. He needed help financially. He needed people to, like, stand up for him. And Buddy Hackett wouldn't. He kind of wouldn't take Lenny's calls anymore. And when Lenny Bruce died and they were trying to raise money for his funeral, uh, Buddy Hackett wouldn't provide any any money. So it was kind of a sad fall. And Kitty, Kitty Bruce talks about it a little bit. And Honey Harlow, who was <clears throat> Lenny Bruce's widow, uh, was really upset because Buddy Hackett and Lenny Bruce originally had been very, very close and in the end, he just left him, left him out to dry. Wow. Okay, one last thing about the book before we talk about your um, fabulous new show on Vice. Oh, yeah, Vice Land. Uh, yeah. You forgot you had a show to I talk forgot about. I forgot I had a TV show. Yeah. Um, so another person, uh, or um, George Carlin credited Lenny Bruce with being his biggest influence. And, uh, hey, my wife is back. Hey, hey Smoochie. She looks so cute when she comes back from working out. Um, hi, Smoochie. Hey. Okay, so uh, let me read this um, quote about George Carlin uh, and the influence that Lenny Bruce had. Carlin was interested in a larger market and accepted a job at WEZE Boston, 1959. The news reporter at the station was Jack Burns, who influenced Carlin's way of thinking. At that time, George was fairly conservative, said Burns. I always had a progressive agenda. I thought it was the duty of an artist to fight bigotry and intolerance. We had long, interesting conversations, good political discussions, Carlin said. I kind of learned my politics and liberalism from him. They became roommates and considered doing a comedy act. But Carlin's stay in Boston was short-lived. W-E-Z-E fired him after he took the station's van on an unauthorized drive to New York to buy a bag of pot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it wasn't Lenny Bruce. I meant the guy... um, Jack Burns. Jack Burns. For him to be a progressive liberal thinker. I think that's interesting. Jack Burns is still uh, alive. <clears throat> he's, I've, been, I've heard that he's sort of like a depressed guy, and that's why he doesn't really talk to people. I wanted to interview him for my book, but he said, I don't want to talk about myself. He was very self-effacing. But Jack Burns, uh, who was a radio guy, as you read in that passage, he and George Burns hooked up, and they did a, a two-man act. And they did very sort of interesting material for that era that was influenced by Lenny Bruce. They did a, a parody of a children's show, almost like a soupy sales thing. Um, where they sold uh, uh, heroin kits on the air, like do-it-yourself heroin shoot-up kits for kids. The George Car- the Fisher is- Price heroin yeah, kit. Yeah, exactly. This is yeah. like 1960, 61. Jack Burns and George Carlin, when they broke up, it was because Jack Burns had gotten sick and Carlin had to go on, I think in Cleveland, by himself one night. So he rewrote their act so that the setups weren't by the straight man Jack Burns they would be by George Carlin himself and so he realized he could do the act on his own without Jack Burns so they went their separate ways Jack Burns joined the second city briefly then he replaced Don Knotts on the Andy Griffith show and Don Knotts went to make movies there's 10 episodes of the Andy Griffith show where Jack Burns is the new deputy sheriff in Mayberry what? I never <clears throat> saw that yeah well you could not possibly follow Don Knotts so it was it didn't really work out so they just kind of uh uh quietly did away with the character but that was george carlin's former comedy partner the new deputy sheriff of mayberry then he hooked up with uh, avery schreiber and it was like a popular 70s comedy act burns and schreiber then jack burns became the director of the muppet show um wow no shit mm -hmm. and then apparently he and jim henson didn't get along for whatever reason so he left 
And then there's that famous sequence from that TV show Fridays, which was the SNL knockoff that Larry David and Michael Richards were in. There's that famous episode that Andy Kaufman hosted. They recreated it for that movie Man on the Moon, where Andy Kaufman's in the middle of a sketch, and then he stops the sketch and goes, I can't do this shit. This isn't funny. And Michael Richards stands up and goes to the cue card guy, grabs the cue cards and throws them in front of Andy Kaufman and says, just read what's on the cards. Yeah. <clears throat> and Andy Kaufman causes a big fight, and he throws water on Michael Richards. In that famous sequence, a director comes running in off the stage and lunges at Andy Kaufman, a guy in like a baseball jacket with a headset, and that's Jack Burns. So Jack Burns was everywhere without anybody even realizing who he was. A partner of George Carlin, the deputy sheriff of Mayberry, <laughs> the director of The Muppet <clears throat> Show, and the guy that lunges at Andy Kaufman on Friday. So he was sort of like a Z-Lig type uh, everyman. Very interesting fellow. Still alive, but... Doesn't really do interviews, but really, really interesting. Wow. That, that should be a movie and a book about him alone. Yeah, he's really fat, and there's more to his trajectory. You can't that. convince him to open up the... Well, he told me that he, he did an, an interview for Comedy at the Edge with Richard Zoglin, but he would only answer questions about George Carlin. He didn't want, want to answer any questions about himself. And I don't know why, but somebody told me it was because he, he has a feeling of unworthiness for some reason so wow remarkable okay do you want to take a break real quick or? sure yeah, yeah let me get some more water <clears throat> okay so now uh you know you're 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 lauded as the the expert of stand-up comedy you've you've, you've got a, a a popular well-received well-reviewed book uh i know you're getting a lot of that um the Barnes and Nobles groupies, and you're, you, you, you know, you, you got a beret and a. I'm, I'm just kidding. What? <laughs> I'm just imagining what it's like to have a a, a hit book. So what are the, what are, what have been the benefits? Uh, traveling have been has been the main benefit. I have not done a Barnes and Noble. I've been very lucky. In terms of ambition, there was an episode of The Daily Show with John Stewart where he interviewed Kurt Vonnegut. The same year that he that he died. One of my favorites. Yeah, and Kurt Vonnegut said something that stuck with me forever, still to this day. <clears throat> he comes on the panel. John Stewart says, thank you so much for being here. And Kurt Vonnegut, I think, confessed that he had not seen much of The Daily Show, but said, you seem to be popular with all the right people. <laughs> And I was like, that's what I want. I don't want uh, uh, fame, but the definition for me of success is to be popular with all the right people, to just be respected by the people that I respect. That's all you need. And so I've had the good fortune of having that. So I don't get booked in Barnes and Nobles, but I get booked in like cool bookstores, you know, uh, Drawn and Quarterly in Montreal was such a cool bookstore. I got to do a show at Mark Twain House in Hartford, Connecticut. Where wow, he, no where, kidding. Yeah, where he wrote uh, his most famous books. And the, the, I'm a huge Twain fan. That that He had that home built yeah. uh, with his money. He invested badly and... Um, and it's a his beautiful- daughter died in the in the home. It, it ended up being a, a a very tragic symbol for him. I've always wanted to just go there. You, you got to do a fucking reading there. Yeah, and it's such a cool and you house. didn't include him as the inventor of stand up comedy. Oh, believe me, I heard about that. I heard about <laughs> oh, that from good. the guy. I'm not the only one that's brought oh, no. this up to you. No, no, Great. the guy there who ran it was like, "How come Twain's not in your book?" I was like, ah. you know, I, it annoys me to. Uh, to be uh, berated, I, there's no there's no uh, uh, editorial choice here, and who is included and who is not included, you know. And also to say the inventor of anything is sort of like people who claim to be the first rapper. It's usually more of a uh, organic, simultaneous thing, sort of like patent wars when somebody invents something in Europe at the same time somebody invents something in America in the year 1850. Yeah. It's more of a parallel. Uh, well, I think movement. what became stand-up comedy, and that, that's just the, always the, the way I've always looked at it. And um, and like I said, that is my the only thing of your book that I thought, oh, was mm-hmm. was left out. So I'm glad well, the Twain people <clears throat> felt the same way. They did feel that. Uh, because feel he, that he honed his, his stage performance like a stand-up comedian. Yeah. He would cut out lines that didn't work. Right. He would nurture stories. He would develop them. And sometimes he had to be half in the bag to... <laughs> <laughs> he was the original Shecky Green, yeah. <laughs> well, I won't deny. I'm not arguing against that theory. I'm just saying that it 
you know. no, 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 I'm not, I'm not criticizing you in any way. It's just the that's the reverence I have for, yeah. for Mark Twain and what I do. I love his nonfiction so much, and he taught me a lot about politics, like reading about. Mark Twain wrote a lot of stuff criticizing the American government for their actions in the Philippines. Hated Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. Thought he was a warmonger. He was, and a white supremacist uh, to boot. So it was sort of uh, interesting when I first started to read Mark Twain. It opened my eyes to uh, uh, imperialism, American imperialism, and how it And that's when it began. It actually, American imperialism began with William McKinley, who... Theodore Roosevelt was his vice president, and he was assassinated by a Spanish anarchist. Right. But it was William McKinley who specifically said that our doctrine should be the world police, right. and we should get involved, right. and our expansionist uh, ambitions yeah, and it was that the fir- Spanish-American war. And it war. was that first era of the lie, we're here to liberate you. So the Spanish-American war, we're here to liberate Cuba from Spain, and then instead America just takes over Cuba rather than, you know... Yeah, work. and Theodore Roosevelt wanted the Panama Canal built, and Panama at the time belonged to Colombia. So he um, nurtured the rebels who wanted independence when Colombia had demanded more money from the American government right. to build the Panama. Yeah, well, it was Mark Twain who introduced me to all that knowledge, you know, and all these horrible things that Roosevelt had said about how we have to Christianize the Philippines. The, he, he used phrases like the slope-eyed, slant-eyed, whatever the phrase he used, but it was Mark Twain's essays about that that were written as it was happening that really opened my eyes. It was It's really interesting to... Listen to these critics of that era, the H.L. Mankins and the Mark Twains. They were so perceptive, and it gives me great solace in this era when we see, like, Nazis on the rise and stuff like that, and you start to feel almost isolated. You're like, wait a second, because I'm a pacifist, which is an isolating thing in America. Um, so it gives me great solace to read these great minds who kind of had a similar outlook, you know, reassures me that, no, you're not wrong. You, you got a moral grounding to what you believe in, you know. Anyways, uh, what were we talking about? Uh, how you had given the reading at the Mark Twain house. Oh, so, yeah. So, I mean, wh- I mean, like I said, I mean, I would be thrilled to just go there. So, yeah, it was super fun. So, what you're, you're, you know, you were in the, in, the, in the library, the reading room. Tell me about it. It's an old uh, Victorian house. And oddly enough across the land there's another victorian house which was uh I'm trying to remember her name beecher stowe the woman who Harriet wrote beecher stowe yeah it was her house so they were neighbors so it was these two literary icons side by side these two gigantic old wooden victorian houses and on the top floor is uh, mark twain's uh, writing room and they they do tours there but it's all roped off and they were giving me a tour but there were also two uh, tourists that were like the tour guide was giving them the tour at the same time and they're like, and this is Mark Twain's uh, writing room. Don't touch anything. And then she goes to me, you can go in there if you want. So she let me in. Oh, to wow. the writing. And then the other two went in. She goes, no, 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 not you guys. Just him because he's a writer. He's written a book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stand back, non-published citizens. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of funny. Um, and then they have a theater um, separate from the house where they do events and stuff. So the thing was at the theater. But it was uh, it was really cool. And uh, they do a lot of uh, uh, cool gigs there. And the guy who manages it. His office has all the posters of all the literary people who have come through there and done uh, readings and stuff like that. So that was really cool. And I did a show in Toronto. What part did you read? Did you choose to read at the Twain House? Uh, I guy interviewed me on stage, sort of like okay. this. So that's what it was, mostly. And I think he read excerpts from the book. I don't really read excerpts from the book because it tends to people's eyes glaze over. So if I just tell the stories that are in the book conversationally, as opposed to telling or as opposed to reading, that tends to work better. That's funny. My my um, one of my oldest best friends won the Pulitzer Prize. Wow. Uh, for the Devil in the Grove, and his name is Gilbert King, and he said the same thing that. It's best at a reading not to read, yeah. to tell the story. Yeah, yeah. well, it's like uh, performance poetry. You know, people that read poems on stage. Like my favorite poet is Farrell and Getty. But he, when he reads, he reads. A Coney Island of the mind. Yeah, and it's it's kind of... <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not going to put down Farrell and Getty. He's my hero. But when he d- does uh, a reading, it's k- kind of dull. Whereas <laughs> it's funny, can I tell you a quick yeah, Farrell and Getty yeah, story? Yeah, yeah, sure. This is about five or six years ago, and to me, um, and bookstores are, are are my 
uh, existence, as you can tell from my massive book yeah. collection. And I'm a snob about bookstores and City Lights Bookstore, which Ferlinghetti uh, started and owns, uh, is my university of life bookstore. I've gained so much knowledge out of there. The place is just a historic place. So it was about five or six years ago. He's in his 90s now. Uh, he was giving a reading there. And I was in, in the city doing shows. And so I wanted to go to... I've never been in the room, same room with the man. It's packed. You can't get in. So I'm standing outside looking in the, the windows of City Lights just to gaze yeah. upon this man yeah. because he's so important to me. And, and I'm just... I can't even hear. I'm just... That's how much I adore the guy. And so two... Early 20s, uh, millennial hipster couple, where they come walking by, and the guy looks in, and then the girl goes, what's going on in there? And the guy goes, ah, it's just some old guy. <laughs> and then they fucking <laughs> walk onwards. But I'll, I'll never forget that. I'm like, war. I'm standing there just to look at the man, and he's, <laughs> ah, it's just some old guy. Oh, Jesus. The reason you can read a swear word in literature because of this man, just some old guy. Well, my book is published by Grove Press. Wow. And Grove Press is the other, the trifecta is New Direction, City Lights, and Grove Press in terms of beat generation literature. And Grove Press won the, the court battle to have Naked Lunch published um, legitimately. Uh, they also were the first publisher to get Tropic of Cancer released in the United States. So Grove Press looms large. So when I got... Um, my contract with Grove Press, I was like, oh, this is perfect. It was like spiritual for me, you know, the full circle. Like, that's what had inspired me to read and write in the first place. Grove Press, New Direction, City Lights, and here my first book deal is with Grove Press. And then they flew me to San Francisco when the book came out to do a show there. And it was my first time in San Francisco. So I was wow. like, my God, my first time in San When I was a boy, when I was 18, I wanted to move to San Francisco. But legally, I couldn't because I was in Canada uh, and Canadian. So... My first time in San Francisco is on Grove Press's dime, and I'm a published author. It was like monumental. And you were for me. were you giving a reading at City Lights? No, uh, wow. I did a show for San Francisco Sketch Fest, so it was for the Comedy Festival. Wow, that's amazing. But it was amazing, and then uh, uh, for and I, I did not yeah. to, not to interrupt you, just so you know, I moved to San Francisco at 22 because of Kerouac. Well, look at that on the road. Well, we're kindred City spirits. Lights. Yeah. So uh, the 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 reason I I, I left my little town in Florida and moved across the country was, you know, and I thought it was the, also, I thought it was the Jerusalem of stand-up comedy because that's where Mark Twain, in my opinion, invented stand-up comedy. In San Francisco, really? That's where he gave his first oh, lectures. Oh, I didn't know this. So in my, I have always called San Francisco the Jerusalem of stand-up sure, comedy. Sure, sure. So in my opinion, that's why it started oh, there. that's so, so cool. So Twain, comedy, and Kerouac, and yeah. the Beats, and yeah. City Lights was why, and that's why that, I go to the City Lights bookstore, I, I, I go there as I did at 22, like seeking knowledge that will enrich my life. I had a beautiful moment there. I was in San Francisco in uh, January filming for my new Viceland series. And uh, we, we wrapped, we were filming at what used to be the Purple Onion, now it's called something else. So I didn't realize it until afterwards and somebody told me that. I go, well, how come nobody told me that? I would have talked about it on camera because, again, a cradle of music and comedy history. But I walked up the street to that bar across that's next to City Lights, Vesuvio. 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 And I had this, and I'd never been in there before. And so I'm looking at all the Bukowski posters on the wall and Beat Generation posters. I go, this is so cool. And I sit down at the bar... <laughs> And this guy, this drunk, this barfly, is sitting next to me. It's a perfect San Francisco moment. Looks over at me. He's like drunk. He goes, hey. Yeah. My brother was the guy who killed the guy at Altamont. What? <laughs> wow. And it all comes together. <laughs> I was like, this is perfect. Perfect. That's the whole story. But I just thought, what a strange and perfect thing to wow. hear. Wow. Where he knifed yeah. the... Um, I used to remember the young black guy's name that got knifed in the back. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But anyway, so there's a, a lofty thing there. The Grove Press, uh, City Lights, uh, the New Directions, all of that was incredible. And so the idea that I was on my publisher's dime touring around, uh, not doing Barnes & Nobles, but doing these kind of cool gigs everywhere, Toronto, Montreal... 
I was just being facetious when I said that. What? The Barnes and Noble. Yeah, I know, I know. But I mean, people do do that. You go to a Barnes and Noble, you see a big poster this Thursday, so and so, and there's one at the Grove, and every week they got yeah different people. Yeah, and if it isn't somebody who isn't like a celebrity, it's just people that go to free events with like twenty plastic bags. So it's kind of like a sad uh, in a way. And then if it's like a celebrity author, there's a big signing. That's the weird thing about publishing. Somebody like Snooky from the Georgie from the Jersey Shore can get a book deal to write a novel and get a million dollar advance and then it debuts number one on the New York Times bestseller list it's kind of indicative of a a lot of things I was very lucky to get this uh, kind of nice book deal as a total unknown you know because usually book deals go to uh, celebrities and if not then you almost self-publish you know it's not uh, it's not a venture that you enter for uh, success you gotta like like doing it but I, I did this book because it was offered to me, not even because I had planned on doing it. So I was very, very fortunate. And Grove Press was the perfect thing. I, I get romantic about all that beat generation stuff because for me, it's a full circle thing. When I was 18, before I started doing stand-up, I hitchhiked from the West Coast to the Atlantic Ocean and back because yeah, I'd never traveled at all. And, across Canada. Uh, mm-hmm, across Canada. And uh, I remember I had a copy of the Dharma Bums with me, which I was reading along the way, which I forgot in the ditch in Nova Scotia, you know. But all of that, uh, uh, at the time, my mother and some other people that knew me thought I was a lunatic, thought I was a crazy person. But I was so inspired by the people that had came before and that I'd read about, you know, that it just seemed like a legitimate thing to do. So all these years later, 20 years later, I can look back and go, I was right. I I have vindicated. Yeah, right. You know, and uh, it's a great feeling, you know, to know that reading books and writing is not something that a bum does. I am a bum, but it's not. It's not wrong, but I had been kind of told that I need to get a, a day job at Radio Shack. You know? I think writing books, making records, make, that making art like that is um, the only thing we have in life to leave behind that yeah. we were here. Well, when you're young, there's a lot of forces against you telling you that you shouldn't be doing that because you don't make money doing it when you're young at all. You know, It takes 20 years plus of hard work to make it pay off. So... It seems like a bad idea for people around you when they witness it, and it kind of gets into your head. Maybe I am a, a nothing, a low life, a, a bum, you know. But then when it pays off, oh my God, sweet, glorious victory. <laughs> <laughs> After I landed in San Francisco that first time and realized, you go, Grove Pet Press paid for this trip. Here I am in San Francisco. I always wanted to come here to the beach area. I literally started laughing out loud like a crazy person my whole walk home from the gig to the to the hotel i was just uh giggling i couldn't believe it i still can't believe it so i'm very grateful so the success of this book obviously led to you having your own show about comedy on vice so um do you want to tell me and the listeners the the premise of the show yeah, so it's sort of a, right now it's a mini-series, depending on if anybody watches it, then it'll be more of a series, but uh, it's sort of like uh, Anthony Bourdain, but instead of f- food, it's about stand-up. So we traveled all over the place, I explore different subcultures of stand-up in each episode, I kind of play like a, uh, um, what's the phrase, like a clueless guy you know because i am in real life and it's not i'm not playing a clueless guy i am a clueless guy but i enter these subcultures with no real conception of what they are so one episode is about the subculture of christian stand-up comedians there's a church circuit guys that do stand-up who are christian for christian audiences what does that mean and when i would mention the premise of this episode of people go christian comedians are, are they are they funny so that's sort of the premise of the episode, just to discover what it's all about. And we visited with a woman in Nashville named Shonda Pierce, who is the most successful Christian stand-up comedian, makes a lot of dough, has her own tour bus, sells out theaters for these sort of church audiences. And the reason she's so successful, I found really illuminating and interesting. It's because she identifies as a born-again Christian, but suffers from crippling depression and is medicated. And the attitude towards her in the church community is if you're truly born again and you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, then you're not going to be depressed. There's going to be no problems. And she's in her stand-up, she talks about, no, there are still problems and you have to address those. And I was suicidal after I was born again. Uh, I had family and kids and I was going to kill myself. And so she talks very frankly about these things in her act. And because of that, honesty uh, became very popular in this sort of Christian stand-up circuit. Same episode, I also shadow these guys who are much further down the ladder in terms of comedy who are just doing 
shitty gigs on the road. <laughs> the, the open mic night Christian circuit. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And it was kind of fascinating. <clears throat> so I went in with my own prejudices, like, oh, this is going to be lame or corny. And I discovered that it's identical to secular stand-up in the, in the, the idea that some of the gigs are great. A lot of the gigs are horrible. They're still doing the road. They're still figuring out an act. People are still heckling. People are still uh, texting during the show. Uh, somebody's selling out a theater and somebody's doing a church gig where only 14 people show up. And some of them are really funny and some of them are really unfunny. And you could say all the exact same things about secular stand-up. So uh, at the end of the episode, I kind of come to that conclusion that despite whatever prejudices I went into it as a man who uh, doesn't identify as a church-going person, that their journey, just like in my book, I talk about how vaudeville comedians have a parallel to comedians today in terms of the struggle, in terms of uh, how you build an act, how you get noticed. Same thing with these uh, people on the church comedy circuit. So one episode is about that. And then we have another episode about uh, uh, comedians on their way up and comedians on their way down. It's sort of a, a treatise on uh, ambition. Is that how you say that? How do you, yeah, treaties, treaties? You, okay. yeah, you pronounce it right. How do you, uh, what's the measuring stick if someone's on their way down? How do you, well, uh, how do you define that? Well, <laughs> again, it, 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 it shattered my preconceptions. I went in there with a premise that got kind of switched halfway through. Um, somebody who was maybe in the public eye once upon a time, but now isn't. So we shadowed Michael Winslow because we couldn't get Sinbad. And Michael Winslow... Michael Winslow's made a lot of money on the, you know... Festival circuit? Just, uh, um, not the, the A rooms, the, you know, yeah. B and C room tier. Well, he was very... Headlining well, he's years. one of those guys who was so visible <clears throat> in the 80s because of the Police Academy movies. And Bobcat is a little bit embarrassed about his Police Academy movies. Right. <clears throat> so Michael Winslow lives in Orlando. Yeah. Instead of Los Angeles or New York. So part of the thing is we set out to go visit with him. Why is he in Orlando? Is there a story here that's like sad? Was he go did he want things to turn out a different way? And then we also shadowed these new comedians who were on their way up doing their first big gigs, first late night gigs, first festivals, who were very ambitious, ambitious and seemed to have everything going for them. Well, what we discovered is that those who had supposedly everything going for them were miserable. And Michael Winslow was like the most grounded, happy man of all living in Orlando. And so it, our idea of a comedian on their way up as a happy thing and the comedian on their way down, which is an arbitrary thing that we bestowed on him as uh, being sad, turned out to be the opposite. The guy who was so-called on his way down was the guy who was the most happy with his life and his uh, successes and different things and he talked about how those Police Academy movies made him very visible and it made him do exactly what he wanted to do anyways. He talked about how he was treated frequently with snobbery in comedy clubs because he did what people considered a gimmick instead of doing uh, jokes and material. He was doing sound effects. Um, but we also talked about how uh, he had been befriended in recent history by Reggie Watts, who is another African-American comedian who does a lot of stuff with sound effects and sounds. Reggie Watts apparently said that uh, Michael Winslow was his hero as a child and why he got into it. And Michael Winslow told us that when he learned that he got in and watched Reggie Watts' act, he's been inspired by Reggie Watts. So now Michael Winslow does stuff with like uh, technology with knobs and buttons and distortions and he's doing music festivals where he freestyle sound effects and they mix it and stuff like this. And so it was fascinating and he was so excited for this new venture in his career doing electronic music festivals with Michael Winslow improvising as opposed to comedy clubs and he was so thrilled and happy and he lives in orlando because his kids are there we met his kids and he's working with his kids and they're helping produce stuff and it was fascinating so here was a man who we thought oh he's on the way down because our perceptions of him are as a guy from the 80s who was well known then but you never hear from now and he was the most happy and these other people we followed who had everything going for them there doing their first big festival there's this agency that wants to book them blah 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 they just weren't happy because they're like I want this and I don't have it if only I could get this I would be happy and it was kind of an interesting meditation on the idea of I think I say this into camera in the episode about does ambition make us unhappy is ambition a negative attribute some people think in America oh if you're ambitious that's a good thing because you're motivated you're out there but really, it's well, making you unhappy. It's the concept of capitalism. You yeah. never have enough. Exactly. And there's always, no matter how rich you are, there's always people who are more rich than you. And in comedy, it's always, 
you're never going to feel fully satisfied because there's always a Kevin Hart or somebody who's more successful, you know, doing things on a higher level than you. So if you compare yourself to anyone else in comedy, you're always going to be miserable. Right. And there are uh, countless miserable yeah. bastards in comedy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's... For a business that makes so many people happy, it's interesting how many unhappy people there yeah. are in it. Yeah. It was, it was, it was really interesting um, kind of observing that and concluding that with that episode. So this Viceland series is called Funny How to take off on the Goodfellas, um, Joe Pesci scene. Cool. Uh, I should tell you, uh, anyone uh, who's a regular listener knows this, um, for years I have been trying to sell a Anthony Bourdain of comedy really? concept. Uh, which was not these angles uh, that, that you've obviously done. I saw the preview for your show, and uh, and it was like, the, does comedy, I guess the premise of that episode was, does comedy make a difference uh, in changing people's minds? Oh, yeah, that was and- an episode specifically about... Uh, the gay scene in comedy. Oh. And uh, in that trailer, yeah, that clip, I talked to Cameron Esposito and Rhea Butcher about this era where things are very politicized and we want to make a difference. And my premise was, well, everybody says that comedy is capable of changing the world or they want it to change the world. They talk about Lenny Bruce. But as a historian, at least in the United States... I don't have any uh, example of historical precedent precedent of um, comedy changing things for the better, other than your mood or to entertain you. And my argument with uh, Cameron and Rhea was that, well, Jon Stewart, Stephen Colbert, The Onion did satire on a very high level in the past uh, uh, 15 years. And yet we have uh, fascism in, in waiting or here in well, America. Yeah, yeah, it's on the rise. Yeah, so... Uh, I th- actually think that the late night comedians helped get Trump elected because of the attitude. I think that they were the face of liberal uh, left-wing Hollywood. I mean, my family are all right-wing Christian Republicans, and um, I have been called a left-wing commie faggot uh, no less than nine trillion times by my brother. And I know people like him dismiss all of Hollywood as like one entity and that I in my perception that maybe the late night comedians criticizing Trump personified just the you know American left the Hollywood liberal it's a weird the idea that there's a uh, Democrat and Republican are your only two choices so yeah. that I think causes so much more harm than good that attitude because then it does allow people to tar everything with uh, with one brush I'm Canadian so how many political parties are there in Canada five in I lived in Amsterdam for five years my wife is from Holland there are um, no less than 16 yeah. parties yeah. in Holland and there are three different Christian parties right there's the Christian right the Christian left and the Christian green left and that's left wing Christians who also care about the environment who think the Christian left is a little too right for them. Yeah. So, I mean, I've tried to explain that to my family uh, until I was breathless that there are more than one flavor of Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, people want there to be a right and a wrong, a black and a white, and it doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily work that way. So on those late night shows, they they generally buy into that. The same thing that other people who are right wing buy into is that the Democrats are this way, the Republicans are that way, and that's it. You know, they buy into the paradigm. And we always see that whenever there's like a drumbeat for war, suddenly everybody's on the same side, you know, and I'm like, except for a crazy person like me who's like, wait, isn't uh, murder immoral? I- I'm in the minority that murdering somebody <laughs> is wrong? Really? Yeah. What? And the Bible clearly says, "Thou shalt not kill." Uh, in the in the preview, you said that you didn't think comedy could change yeah, um, change, yeah. society. Yeah. Which um, me, as a hopeful dreamer person, that's always been the ideal that I've mm-hmm. I've, I've held on to, right. and um, um, hope right. that that maybe it could. Yeah. <clears throat> so why do you think it it, it well, couldn't change? Well, in the opinion? episode. Um, 
again, it's I like it was all organic when we filmed these episodes, but I always went in with this premise, whatever the episode was, with some kind of preconception and had it kind of changed by the end. So Rhea and Cameron gave me a lot of food for thought and maybe changed my perspective. I said, well, Jon Stewart, Stephen Colbert, The Onion, if it would truly be effective, then why would we have Donald Trump? And they said, well, with all due respect, social movements and social change is usually predicated by the oppressed and oppressed and the, and the uh, predicated is not the right word to use. It's usually uh, um, uh, uh, what's the phrase? activated by the oppressed or by minorities. So women's suffrage w- movement, civil rights movement. It's not the overlords that are affecting change. And so they said, with all due respect, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, The Onion, mostly uh, white men, mostly uh, Harvard graduates, as opposed to uh, minorities, as opposed to gay people. So they said that we think it can be a vehicle for change. If those people are on the rise in comedy, they're the ones who are going to enact social change. And I was like, oh, that's a very interesting perspective. And I'm open to that because I, like you, want to believe that comedy can be a vehicle for social change. But as a historian trying to be as objective as possible, I have no tangible example. And you hear a lot about how, oh, uh, the Jews are funny because to, to address pain, you have to be funny, blah, 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 help them survive. Blah, blah. I go, but yeah, but World War II, six million people, the, the comedy did not, Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator did not save any uh, lives, you know? So when it comes to the really lofty... It irritated uh, Hitler because he, he <laughs> loved right. him so much he emulated Charlie's mustache. Yes, yeah. Because he wanted to be adored by the world masses yeah. the way Charlie was. He loved so Charlie. The, so the great dictator genuinely hurt Hitler's feelings. It, so, well, I mean, I mean if, we, if we can I mean, determine I, that that's why he committed suicide, then yeah, <laughs> that would be great. But you know what I mean. So... It's usually, I, I have a theory that one of the reasons maybe comedy doesn't enact or hasn't enacted social change is because social change is enacted by large groups of people together, where stand up is one person on stage. Um, in order for comedians to enact social change, it's got to be hundreds and thousands of comedians in, in the streets. You know, Dick Gregory was a great civil rights activist, and his comedy addressed the civil rights struggle. But when it came down to it, he felt that he had to leave the stage and join the marchers in the streets in order to be most effective. It ultimately led to him leaving stand-up altogether. So he felt, and I, I wish I was wrong, but he's probably right, that in order to enact social change, that's what you need, is seas of people in the streets protesting and applying pressure on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. You know, A lot of people that criticize protest movements, uh, they'll say, well, it doesn't change anything. Y'all went out and uh, protested at the women's march, it didn't seem to change anything. Well, no one day changes anything. Women's suffrage movement wasn't one day of protest. Civil rights movement wasn't one day of protest. Vietnam War protest wasn't one day of protest. Day after day after day, week after week after week, unfortunately, often year after year after year. But that does have an effect over the course of uh, time. So I don't know the comedy can enact uh, social change because I haven't seen a tangible American example yet. And I, I specify American because there may be another example in the world I'm just not aware of. Um, I thought we were moving forward progressively as a society. Um, And then with the election of Trump and the rise of fascism in this country, um, where we sit today, I'm uh, completely astonished. And um, all of my idealistic feelings about the influence of comedy and entertainment on American society has been shattered. But that being said, uh, uh, (laughs) fascism is uh, bankrolled. And it's bankrolled by a small amount of, of very wealthy people who are a minority. So there is that. They're more, the, the wealthy minority is more powerful because they're more wealthy. But they're still a smaller contingent of the population. And they're very powerful. You know, There's a great book out right now called Dark Money by a journalist named Jane Meyer. Which you got to read. It's just unbelievable. Every news story that happens on a daily basis now, you can unwind the reason behind it by reading that book. So right now there's a thing about uh, Bernie Sanders' wife. Uh, they're accusing her of uh, fraud for some reason. And I'm like, after reading this book, Dark Money, I go, oh, it's an orchestrated campaign by one of these multiple... To f- besmirch him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it, there's a good Ralph Nader biography that came out before he ran for president. Talks about him in the 60s, how uh, General Motors and one of the other big auto manufacturers hired multiple private eyes to 
shadow Ralph Nader and try and set him up in compromising positions with prostitutes. And Ralph Nader being essentially asexual never took the bait. But it was fascinating how they were trying to come up with a orchestrated way to discredit him with something completely unrelated, but so that he would become unpopular and uncredible in the in the public consciousness. So that happens all the time behind closed doors. You know, these forces that are uh, orchestrated to defame somebody somehow, and it seems like we'll read the headline and go, oh yeah, fraud, not realizing who's behind the push to change the sort of uh, uh, public perception. So I don't think that the rise of fascism is the majority of people in this country by any sense. But the- I don't think it's the majority, but I'm surprised at the large number. Yeah, you know, propaganda is a very uh, uh, powerful force. So if you can control the channels I, of communication... I, didn't, I, I never thought the bullies would take over and uh, you know be a dominating factor. Yeah, well, in the schoolyard, <clears throat> a bully can still uh, bruise you and make you bleed. You know, so. But then years later, he has a manual labor job, and the people who were bullied were. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's usually yeah. been the uh, the natural. Um, I think it's when you, when you explain things to people in very plain terms and leave the idea of a Democrat or Republican out of it, don't use the word socialism or anything like that, just on a very human level, do you think that? This should be provided for a person. Or if you saw somebody in front of your house in your driveway and they were aching in pain, would you help them? You know, instinctually, most people would say yes, of course. But as soon as you bring into the sort of political parameters of it and take away that sort of individual human level, then people, uh, 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 their opinions change. George Carlin had that great bit about politician saying it's about the children it's about the children we have to take care of the children but as soon as you grow up to be an adult fuck them yeah. you're on your own you know? yeah it's funny well I've, I've talked to a few people in my family who are you know staunch right-wing republicans and huge christians that uh in my opinion you can't call yourself a christian if you want to do absolutely nothing for anyone else if you're against uh, you know, people having education and health care. The idea of Christianity has been hijacked in this country, you know, and I, I spoke about and this. That, yeah, and used as a political weapon. I, I spoke about this during um, when I was following these Christian comedians around. And uh, one of the Christian comics that we followed is this great guy named uh, Leland Clausen, who uh, was raised Mennonite, who are not unlike Quakers. They're anti-war. They're pacifists. And he said, yeah, Christianity has a bad PR problem in this country. The people that are acting as the spokesmen shouldn't be the spokesmen. You know, these are these are people that wish harm on others. I'm fascinated by the history of uh, the Catholic Workers Movement, which is a pacifist movement. You know, they believed in God. They believed that uh, murder was uh, wrong, no matter what, even in self-defense. So I kind of subscribe to that. Um, I many times over the course of my life have deserved to be uh, punched in the face. And I never have. I've never been in a fist fight, even as a child. <laughs> Few people would ever admit that. Yeah, no, I definitely. And by saying that, I probably will get a, a punch in the face. But I think it's, I learned this uh, working in the mental health field. For a while, I worked in the mental health field with drug addicts and stuff. And I learned, and this should be obvious, but people don't realize this, that if you're being antagonized by somebody, and you antagonize back, you escalate the situation. But if somebody antagonizes you, and you don't antagonize them back, Eventually, you, it de-escalates the situation. And that is sort of the, the philosophy we have to um, understand. What are the similarities between mental patients and stand-up comedians? Well, um, show business as a whole, not just comedians, um, there's a lack of accountability Uh, Stand-up comedians, the cliche is the tears of the clown, that they're all depressed. But I don't believe that's true. I believe that everybody is depressed. It doesn't matter if you're a comedian. Everybody's on meds in this country, so clearly something's going on. But the one pathology that and mental health issue that is rampant in comedy has never been addressed. It's really important, should be addressed. And watching TV news should show you how dangerous it can be if unchecked, and that's narcissistic personality disorder. And the overwhelming majority of comedians... We reward that with the presidency in this this country. Why? How is it ever going to be in check? Yeah. But most comedians, talented or otherwise, tend to be narcissists. And some people will say, well, you need that. You need to have an ego to be in public life, to be on stage. Maybe for the 45 minutes you're on stage. 
But even then, I don't know. But like off stage, it just wreaks havoc in people's personal lives. You know, so many comedians can't have a proper relationship. You know, so self centered. And then that Machiavellian aspect that is all about Hollywood, about climbing over the other person to get to the top, is so unnecessary. I learned this the hard way because I used to think that that's what you needed to do to achieve things was you kind of used people. Well, this person's connected to this person, so I should know them and, you know, I'm going to treat them a certain way. And the reality is if you're a proper person, a human person, a generous person, an open person, an honest person, without narcissism, with gratitude and um, humility, you'll get just as far because really the key to success is not as they tell you in capitalist culture, uh, hard work or stepping on the other person, it's uh, good luck, which you can't control. So if you're a humble person, you'll have good luck. Maybe if you're an asshole narcissist, you'll also have good luck. So if you're going to choose one or the other, uh, humility, I think, is more important. But uh, narcissistic personality disorder is also kind of a uh, aspect of, of, as you put it, the mental case or even the drug addict Drug addicts often become narcissists because the only thing that's important is uh, not going into withdrawal, you know. The fix. Yeah, so you'll steal from your own mother, which in a way is a type of narcissism. Also, the combination of addiction that you can't really control. I think you, got, you can be in control of your own nar- narcissism, but it requires self-awareness. And 99% of narcissists are not self-aware. The president isn't self-aware. I'm only self-aware that I was a narcissist because I did... Uh, intense uh, LSD dose and I was like stepped out of my own body and was like oh my god look at yourself you terrible human being (laughs) really yeah and then you came out of it and well I still struggle with it I still have it I still have uh, narcissism and sometimes when I'm talking my brain and my mouth will be like arguing with each other because I'll be saying something to somebody and then my brain will be go listen to yourself (laughs) that's not true what do you say you're bragging about something that didn't even happen (laughs) And I'll be like, yeah, I did this. I'm the best. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. And my brain's like, no. You know. And then afterwards, I'll think about it. And I go, it's really a tough thing to control. But I think the first step, just like a drug addict, first step to uh, getting past it is acknowledging that it's an issue and that it's a problem and that it exists. Most comedians are narcissists and very few of them acknowledge it. And I think that is their probably primary mental health issue. Wow. So how many episodes have you done and uh, what are some of the other uh, premise angles that you've taken? So far, we've done five episodes for the Viceland show. There's also the history of comedy on CNN, which got picked up for a second season that I'm a consulting producer on. So that those two shows are keeping me busy. Um, are they still going forward with that? Yeah, they took it off TV because the news... The first one was great, and then it seemed to... Uh, disappear, yeah. yeah. It'll be back July 16th, uh, starting on Sundays. They're going to be airing it. They had such a big opening. They promised it, yeah, with all that publicity, publicity and billboards. And billboards. Oh. It was on the side of the building next to the comedy store. They, they, they blew it. They blew and it. And then the, the, the constant barrage of, I mean, like your book, I was very excited. And when when it um, the night it came on, I, I rushed back to the hotel, wherever I was performing, to friggin' watch it. I, I, I And then it disappeared. Yeah, it disappeared. They kept preempting it. It's weird that... The same way that it doesn't matter if you say something that's true or false anymore in politics or, or news. News advertises... Every- Facts are a thing of the past, yeah. Cliff. CNN advertises everything as breaking news. Yeah. In my day, he had to fly an airplane into a building to get a banner <laughs> that said breaking news. Now it says breaking news and it's just Don Lemon interviewing some bozo giving his opinion. And yeah. it says breaking news. So we got preempted on CNN for so-called breaking news three weeks in a row until they were like, okay, we'll reschedule it for a weekend later in the summer. Like, oh, great. Donald Stay- Trump scratched his ass on the way to the helicopter. Yeah. Because you study the history of show business and they talk about the TV show didn't succeed. It didn't go beyond one season, but it was so great. Blah, 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 blah. And then you read up and you go, oh, it had been on a Monday. Then they moved it to a Wednesday. Then it was at 930. Then it, that always kills a show. So it sort of will have uh, killed our momentum to a great deal with this CNN show. But it is coming back and it did get renewed for a second season for what it's worth. So hopefully it'll be at least on a streaming service. But anyways, the Viceland show, which is separate. Uh, the other premise is, uh, there's one about bombing. Actually, we talk a lot about Mitch Hedberg in that episode um, about his Comedy Central special and how it has became a cult classic, but when he taped it, it didn't go well. The first half, it was really like floundering and 
Uh, he makes a lot of references to it during the special, like uh, the Mitch Hedberg not so special and stuff like that. Um, so we talk about, we try and frame for a civilian audience what the existential experience of bombing on stage is like. You know, we're, again, almost like my narcissism, where something's coming out of your mouth, you're doing your act, but your mind is thinking of something completely different, you know. Um, Dave Attell's in that episode. Artie Lang is in that episode. So there's a bombing episode, a gay-themed episode, Christian comedian episode, comedians on their way up and comedians on their way down, and what is the other one? Oh, can comedy be taught? So we shadow... A, we go to UCB and we talk to Matt Besser about the improv classes and the training there. And I st- <clears throat> start off the episode saying, obviously you can teach improv because there's rules that you have to adhere to. Otherwise, it doesn't work at all. You can't create a scene. Commit, sell, keep it going. <laughs> yeah. And it's also like a team <clears throat> thing. You can even be a not funny person and be a good improviser. But I don't think you can be a not funny person and be a good stand up. So then we go and shadow a stand-up comedy class. And my conception, preconception, is that you can't teach stand-up. But, obviously, you can learn stand-up because everybody who does stand-up learned how to do it. But you can't teach somebody to do stand-up. So that's my contention. This is the one episode where, at the end of the show, my premise remained the same. At the end, I go, you you can't teach stand-up. But we go to a stand-up class in Santa Monica. This guy teaches a stand-up course. People pay however many hundreds of dollars, and then he teaches you how to be a stand-up. And it's I've watched several cuts of it now, and I can't watch the episode anymore. It's so uncomfortable for me because I get in a big fight with the teacher about where I go, you can't teach it. And there's this class of kids that have paid money, so they're arguing with me. Of course you can teach it. And I say to the teacher, I go, is there anybody of note that ever took this class and then uh, moved on to something bigger? He goes, yeah, Anthony Jeselnik took this class. Wow. Before he started. I go, what do you think Anthony Jeselnik would say if he were here today? And he goes, oh, I think he would say that he learned joke structure, that he learned this, that, that his whole career is because of this class. I go, because before I came in here today, I Googled your class, uh, your name, the teacher's name, and because it sounded familiar. And I realized that I had interviewed Anthony Jeselnik two years ago, and he talked to me about this class, and uh, this is what he said. So I read to the teacher in front of the class with Anthony Jeselnik. Oh, shit, and it's unflattering. (laughs) You can't teach comedy. This is the best example of that. This is the best example of those who can't teach. You can't learn anything from a comedy class, and this class is the best example of that. So it turned into like a very confrontational cringy curb your enthusiasm moment (laughs) the whole class turned on me i was like a wrestling villain they're like booing and catcalling and but good comedy classes are a waste of time the the only way you learn is is trial by fire you go to open mic nights and uh i've had this conversation with, with dave Chappelle. the exciting thing about comedy is everyone starts the same you 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 there's no shortcut you go to open mic nights you eat shit yeah. sandwiches you're it's a it's a series of humiliations and failures and that's why most people don't stick with it and you know you have so many failures and humiliations it angers you and inspires you to write harder and try harder yeah until it's like water skiing finally what was uh, difficult and impossible now you're on top of the water and you're gliding yeah and your legs are shaky but then you do it more and more and then you know you you can do it with some style and panache and the, yeah, it's the such girls a... on the beach are admiring <laughs> you yeah. and that's such a rewarding feeling when you finally when it starts to click and one of the things I love about stand-up is like every year you kind of reach another level. And again, it's you can't really tangibly put it into words. But there, I remember when I was doing stand-up, there was like an existential feeling of maybe my 350th show or something like that. We're in the middle of my act. I suddenly just felt com- so comfortable. And I didn't say anything about it as it was happening. But as I was doing my act, I was just like flowing and like kind of stopped doing my act for the first time really and was just talking and it was killing and i was like this is a new level that only comes with doing and doing and doing i always say that to 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 young comedians and people that there's nothing more exciting than when a comedian gets self-confidence and then you can speak extemporaneously Mm -hmm. uh you can handle distractions hold on someone's at the door yeah okay 
Okay, that was the ongoing. Uh, <laughs> we should. We've had problems with our downstairs neighbor who has just been complaining for months every time we walk across oh. the apartment, and it came to a head. Um, the, the on Saturday they came. I was out of town. I was in Minneapolis, and they are you know talking to my wife. They keep calling security every time we walk. Oh my god. That we're stomping. They keep saying we're stomping. So um, they came and, and told my wife she's stomping. And she said, I, I am not stomping. I have never stomped. And they called her a liar. So I went down there Sunday and talked to them. And uh, they thought we were having this noise war. And I told them, I said, listen, uh, you know, the first time they complained, the, the, the first week of May they moved in, my mother was visiting. She goes to bed at nine. We were tiptoeing around. So I said, you made two noise complaints then. Uh, so they keep complaining. Uh, we live next to uh, CBS Television City. There's always um, uh, construction and yeah. noise. The, the downstairs neighbor next to them, you can hear uh, hip hop coming but they're calling security when we walk. So I said, we're going to we're gonna get, uh, on Monday, we're going to get everyone who's in charge of this building to come to both apartments, and we're going to demonstrate. And so you couldn't hear, you could hear, I, w I was down there in their apartment. You, it's, you hear squeaking noises. You hear, and so the guy kept saying, luxury apartments, there shouldn't be any noise, luxury apartments. And I said, look, you can go to thousands of buildings around Los Angeles, it has the word luxury on it. This building is 30 years old, I think luxury yeah. has worn off. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 as a comedian, countless times in my career, they said that they're going to send a limousine to pick me up. Uh, and what showed up was a van with the word limousine on the side. Yeah. So I don't know what you were expecting with, um, <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so it's, it's funny that that is, uh, I should just leave that in the, in the episode, <laughs> the manager coming to ask if, uh, if we've had any other problems with these neighbors, but anyway, so, uh, so uh, I'm thrilled that you stayed so long and let me talk to you for so long. What were the, what was the last thing we were talking about? The, the premises of, of episodes? <clears throat> Uh, oh, you as a comedian getting confidence. That was it. Oh, yeah. Uh, and can and, you teach and I, I think that is the most exciting thing when um, a comedian gets confidence because you can handle anything. You can speak extemporaneously. Well, it's amazing. Like, you can tell you've done stand up long enough that when you go to a show and there's a kid who's on stage in their first 20 uh, appearances, you can tell whether somebody has it or not. And that it's just even when they're bombing. People that aren't comedians, and I don't want to say that I'm a comedian, but I did stand up for eight years, so I feel like I'm informed in a way that other people that write books about comedy might not be. You can tell when somebody's going to grow into something uh, worthwhile. You can tell whether somebody has the spark, whether they're funny, even if they're bombing, even if they. An audience equates bombing with unfunny and killing with funny, and that's it. Very black and white. Whereas a comedian has like x ray vision, they have an instinct, and they know this person who's bombing is hilarious. You know, in under di different circumstances, they'll be better, or as they grow, they'll get better. Likewise, you can see through somebody's magic tricks who's destroying, who is shit. You know, that's not uncommon either. You know, you can figure out anybody who has a punch, <clears throat> anybody who has a punchline, da 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 da, mom. You know, they're just yeah. Doing certain a rhythms where I'll, I'll, you, comedy forever has. If you use the certain <laughs> rhythm in a joke, it works. I also think that likability is ninety percent. Yeah. That's why you see guys who are shitty joke writers who don't have great original thoughts who go very far in this business where uh, there's guys who are brilliant joke writers and they're not very likable on yes. stage this and they don't go very far. Story of my life. You could be the greatest joke writer ever, but like people aren't, aren't clicking <laughs> I with you. can relate to that. I'm highly un <laughs> un unlikable. I, I wasn't throwing that at you. It's no, funny that you like, no, uh, I am, uh, you I'm, grabbed it and owned I'm it. I'm highly unlikable. <laughs> that was definitely my problem. Well, I was always astounded when I did stand up where I would see somebody on stage bombing and they wouldn't address it. They wouldn't mention it. They do 45 minutes to silence just their act. I was like, how do you do that? I think the little asides are great. Yeah, I, well, that's I, where I, most I, of I've, my laughs were. I've invented uh, countless yeah, little, uh, sure. and that's little like, throwaway sure. lines. And that's for, for and, Andy Kindler, the basis of his whole trajectory is kind of deconstructing 
uh, a lack of reaction or what's going on there. And so if I was bombing, I would address it, but not in like a charming way. <laughs> like it was, it was that idea that if I'm, I think David Tell even says this in my uh, bombing episode that if I'm going down, I'm taking everybody with me, you know? <laughs> so it was sort of, it was sort of like that. And that doesn't endear you to anybody. It just became uh, unlikable. Like, especially later in my, well, I should, not later in my career, but midway through my career, when I felt entitled to laughs, which is a mistake, but I would do really well with a certain act, and then when it wouldn't get a laugh, then I was like indignant uh, with the audience. Later years, if I bombed, I was apathetic about it, and I kind of enjoyed, I don't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing, I kind of enjoyed riding the wave of the bomb because it didn't affect me emotionally anymore. Whereas it used to destroy me. Like if I bombed, I couldn't function for a couple of days until I did another show. But then towards the end of my career, if I bombed, I was like, eh. But I think that maybe is a bad thing. That apathy is not a good uh, requisite to have. Uh, what was your best joke? What joke were you the most proud of that you wrote? I don't think it holds up anymore. Okay. It's a problem with comedy, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was a strong joke. I think when I was doing my book tour, I did... Somebody asked me that, and I did the joke and got nothing. And I was like, oh, no, it doesn't work anymore. Because times have changed. It uses words that are not acceptable anymore. Um, I'll tell that joke. <clears throat> uh, and it was based on reality. Because I got booked for this show in some sports bar. And the guy who was booking me was, like, chewing the whole time. He goes, yeah, so it doesn't pay a lot, but you get free wings. You get some wings. This is not the joke, but this is how <laughs> I wrote this joke. So then I, I, the joke I did on stage, and it was a great uh, diffuser because I looked, uh, I had a big beard at the time and big hair. And uh, at the time that I was doing stand-up, now everybody sort of looks like me who does stand-up, corner room glasses and stuff. But at the time, it, it was not a look. So I'd go up on stage in a comedy club and go, oh, it's great to be here. This is a nice crowd. You know, sometimes when you do stand-up, you get booked at places that are not the most appropriate. I did a show the other night at a sports bar, and they just hated me. But this is the thing about stand-up. You have your good shows, you have your bad shows. No matter what, you always walk away having learned something new. For instance, at this sports bar the other night, I learned that I'm a fucking fag. <laughs> so that was... Why would you think that wouldn't hold up? Sometimes when I use being the word, hated by a jock, people, thug, mis people misunderstand uh, the bully and being called a fag is uh, yeah. is the story of my life and my interaction with Pe my family. People misunderstand <laughs> the intent of the joke. Oh, just the word. They hear the word ah. fag and they clam up like I'm calling somebody a fag, as opposed to me being called a fag. You're clearly the victim in the yeah, joke, I think. But it, for some reason, maybe it's just because of the context. I'm not doing it in my act. I don't know. But the couple times that I've tried to retell that joke as referring to my old stand-up act. Uh, just the word. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. I mean, I still think it's a good joke, but. Anyway, so that was that was. And as a as a guy who uh, was was called a you know left wing commie faggot his whole life, I I think that's um, you're the underdog and the victim in the story. <laughs> it's funny. So it's anybody who was like, oh my god, I heard a buzzword and now I'm upset. Yeah, I can't process any other thoughts because this ugly word has entered my brain. Yeah, but. If I were still doing stand-up and I did discover that that was the case, where that joke always got that kind of reaction, I would stop doing it. I wouldn't be indignant about it. Because I think the greatest tragedy in comedy is for any of us to be Bob Hope in 1968. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the Bob Hope uh, 1967 Christmas special from Vietnam is on... Uh, YouTube and uh, I've, I've watched it several times and it's you know just pro-government pro-war pro-oil company and then he trots out the uh, the puppet figurehead uh, president of South Vietnam and stuff it's it, it, it's incredible well and Bob Hope used to complain all the time about college kids and the, the kids dig me the protesters and whatever and he would say ah he did a ma an interview with life magazine he goes you know it's communist control these kids aren't thinking for themselves they're reading a script from the communist and so sometimes when i hear somebody like jerry seinfeld who i love complain about college audiences or you can't joke about anything anymore you hear that a lot um all i can think of is bob hope 1968 because jerry seinfeld's in his 60s now 
there's nobody who's 19 who, right. who, who wants to listen to him. So that's a tragedy in comedy. And a that bit. joke that he got in trouble for, that he said that, he was saying the way he's looking at his phone, he's like a gay French king. Yeah. Now, see, that, I think, is a derogatory way to bring up gay people. Mm-hmm. Not where you're being called um, uh, um, uh, 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 a derogatory term for gay people. When Jerry Seinfeld that, complained... And that joke really isn't that funny. Well, that's the thing. There's a sense of entitlement. The audience didn't laugh, and he blamed the audience for not laughing. The old Jerry Seinfeld, before he was the biggest star, would have gone back and tried to rewrite it until it got Make a it laugh. made it funnier. Yeah, which is what obviously you have to do. So... Um, Comedy doesn't age well, and almost every living comedian outlives their popularity. You know, and it always happens. There's a changing of the guards. The young comedians are always the ones who are the most popular in their 20s and 30s. There are exceptions, but there's not too many people who live on and remain in popularity. Jerry Lewis is still alive. Mort Saul is still alive. Shecky Green is still alive. And people are just not interested. The one exception I can think of, one great exception, was George Burns, because he reinvented himself, did a completely different act when he was in his 90s than when he was in his 30s. And the act was about being in his 90s and being a playboy and a hedonist, and people loved it. Rodney Dangerfield, the same thing. Here's a hangdog guy, beleaguered-looking guy, and he's talking about fucking broads and smoking marijuana, and college kids loved that because it was like this weird... Um, juxtaposition that you wouldn't expect from a guy his age. But most comedians do not uh, adjust their act for their age to appeal to young people. Instead, they become indignant if the young people don't like their old act. And I think that's misplaced outreach. And it's frustrating for a comedian. I can understand that. And if I did that joke and I was still doing stand-up and I said, I'm a fucking fag and people didn't laugh anymore, I'd be like, God damn it. It used to be such a strong joke. But that's just the reality you have to adapt. But I, I hear people make jokes like that all the time. Oh. You know, I mean, like they're putting themselves down and stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, that's uh, there's better ways to make a point. But like you said, you just rewrite something until it's funnier. Well, the other thing is that you, you it's a trap and stand up to stick with what you know always gets a laugh instead of like trying to go through the process again of turning over your material and coming up with stuff that's new because it's such a struggle to to develop new material so it's it's easy to use your own material as a crutch for a long long time i would say the answer to everything is write better jokes that's the answer to everything what knowledge nugget have you gained from spending so much time with comedians and studying comedy what insight on life can you give us Well, uh, one thing in general is that I don't think the trope of the depressed comedian is uh, true. I think the it kind of does disservice to everybody who does suffer from depression who isn't a comedian by focusing on that. Trope. Yeah, I've never believed in that and the suffering for your art, which I thought was the way to be a great artist when I was younger. I don't believe that anymore. I think being an evolved human yeah. And, and having a happy life um, I think the, the, translates. I think it's important. It's great. <clears throat> Both of us have a, an enormous passion for comedy. We're interested in comedy. But I can tell by your library here that you have a vast number of interests that are not just comedy. I think that's really important for all comedians to, to be passionate about other things and not be uh, guilty about their other interests. Because interests other than comedy will be made fun of within comedy. If you say, oh, I love poetry, I love Lawrence Ferlinghetti, that's an easy thing to make fun of and ridicule, but it's also a more evolved thing to have a fully formed uh, uh, personality in a way. I don't know what a I would say. A poem is a joke without a punchline. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> true. That's how I see these uh, storytelling uh, shows now. I'm like, oh, it's just stand-up that's not funny. But uh, I don't know. I don't know what I what I've learned other than that we're all uh, we're all suffering and we're all doomed. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no hope for any of us. Good night, uh, Cliff. It's been an absolute joy to to talk so extensively with you about um, comedy and and this this great book that I think um, everyone who loves comedy 
should read. And uh, I mean, it's an all time uh, classic on on the history of comedy. Thank you. For, even though you thank know, you very much. If anybody <laughs> wants to read it, they can. And if they don't, they don't. The beauty of writing a book is that it lasts forever. And half the books in your house are probably written by people that are now dead. Yeah, and a lot of them are out of print. Yeah, and I, I love that because I read books like I was telling you earlier about A.J. Must, who's this pacifist. These books are from the 30s. I don't think anybody read any of them after World War II because they felt that it disproved his point. But here he lives on in my uh, living room as I read him. And uh, I love the fact that this uh, gives me uh, infamy or uh, what's what's the phrase? It's the way to immortality. Immortality. Thank yeah, you. I mean, that, the book will be around... Uh, you know, long after you're dead. That's why I, I think that mm-hmm. the art we create in life is all we have to leave behind. Yeah. So I mean, and and when you when you're when I'm reading a book, I feel like I'm having a conversation with the author. Mm-hmm. So you will be having a conversation with readers, uh, you know, for for many many years. Yeah, I'm ready to retire. I think I'm done. <laughs> you're done. You've peaked. Yeah. I, uh, I can't wait to see the new show, and uh, I, I'm I'm very happy to meet you. In closing. Is there any words of wisdom or advice that you have for the people of the earth? Good Lord. Uh, don't kill each other. Murder's wrong. I know that's not a popular <laughs> not a popular phrase these days. Uh, oddly enough, I think you're the first person ever to say that. <laughs> I've asked that question to so many people, and you're the first person to say yeah. murder is wrong. Well, it's a very polarizing issue these days. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, Cliff. Thank you so much, brother. Long may you run. Bring him down and get your feet back on the ground.